Salam alaikum. I know that the prior two segments have been really long and some of you have complained the reason we keep these segments contained together is to make sure that all of the topics that are related to one single subject are within the same video. You can break it up and watch it as you want over different periods of time. The question for today is what is shaitan and what is the Qareen? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي The topic as I said is what is shaitan and what is the qareen and we're going to discuss several important questions including what's the difference between iblis and shaitan we're going to present for the first time I believe the Quranic Nafs psychological model, which includes Iblis and Shaitan. We're also going to talk about the Quranic theory of knowledge. This will be toward the end of the segment. So I really encourage you to stick around and watch the whole segment until the end. If you have to break it up, that's fine. But make sure you watch all the parts of it. This segment is part 2.10 of the series called Why No Stories Equal No Quran where we discuss how to extract Abrahamic locution from dhikr, from the Quranic stories and parables. As you know, the dhikr or the Quranic stories and parables represent over 60% of the Quran. And therefore, if we don't understand dhikr in the Quran, we really don't understand the vast majority of the Quran. I encourage you to watch all the prior segments in this series, especially the last two segments before proceeding with this one. This will build on prior concepts that we've discussed, and it is very important that you follow the instructions that we gave in earlier segments. We want to try to save time, so we're not going to repeat these same instructions. Very importantly, please do not ask questions in the comment stream unless you have watched this full video all the way to the end very likely your questions are answered within the video segment. In this segment, we're going to continue the story of Adam from Surah Al-Baqarah from Ayah 36 to 39. We're also going to provide more details about Iblis, the counterpart, the Zawj, as we discussed before. We're going to give a full definition of Shaitan, his objective, his strategy. We're going to talk about an important paragraph from Surah An-Nisa, which detail exactly how the shaitan operates and against whom does the shaitan operate. As I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to provide the nafs psychological Quranic model, which provides the details of the definition of the components of nafs or the self in the Quran, according to the Quran. We're also going to talk about the difference and the collaboration between Iblis and Shaitan, the two foes that are assigned to us as human beings. We're also going to talk about a long paragraph from Surah Qaf, Surah 50, specifically about the Qareen. And this will clear a lot of confusion that has been circulating within the Muslim Ummah about the definition of Qareen, as you will see for yourself. We will give a brief introduction to something called the Quranic epistemological model. This will be toward the end and we will conclude with the Quranic theory of knowledge. I know these terms seem difficult, but I promise you we will make them easy. We will provide the information in a detailed manner, in a slow manner, so that everybody can understand. So if you have the patience, inshallah, we have the information that will make you very well informed, inshallah. So as you see, we have a lot to cover. Find a quiet place to watch. Don't allow Iblis or Shaitan to distract you from watching the full segment, inshallah. We start immediately with Iblis as the counterpart, the typical translations of a paragraph from Surah Al-A'raf. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Rajim. Huwa alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidatim wa ja'ala minha zawjaha liyaskuna ilayha. Falamma taghashaha hamalat hamlan khafifan. فمرت به فلما أثقلت دعوا الله ربهما لئن آتيتنا صالحا لنكونن من الشاكرين فلما آتاهما صالحا جعلا له شركاء فيما آتاهما فتعالى الله عما يشركون 
So I'm only going to share with you two translations out of many, and they all follow pretty much the same theme. From the translation by Muhsin Khan, he says, It is he who has created you from a single person. And then he adds Adam between parentheses, even though the ayah itself does not mention Adam at all. And then he has created from him his wife, Hawa, Eve. All of this information is not there at all in order that he might enjoy the pleasure of living with her. Again, there is no information or indication to justify this kind of detail. When he had sexual relation with her, she became pregnant and then she carried it about lightly. Then when it became heavy, they both invoked Allah, meaning supplicated to Allah, their Lord saying, if you give us a salih, meaning a good in every aspect, child, we shall indeed be among the grateful. Shakirin. this is how they defined Shakirin. Muhammad Asad has a little bit better interpretation and translation, but still he fell into the same trap. He fell into the same preconceived notion of what this ayah is supposedly talking about. So he says, it is he who has created all out of one living entity. This is a little bit better. And out of it brought into being its mate so that man might incline with love towards woman. These details right here are not in the ayah whatsoever. And so when he has embraced her, I think he's referring to this part right here from Muhsin Khan's translation. She conceives what at first is a light burden and continues to bear it. And then when she grows heavy with child, they both call unto their God, their sustainer. If thou indeed grant us a sound child, we shall most certainly be among the grateful. The reason I'm highlighting these two translations is to illustrate something that we've started talking about heavily in the last few segments, which is the concept of cognitive biases. A cognitive bias is a preconceived notion or some thinking defect that we all suffer from to one degree or another. And then we apply these concepts ahead of time before we read into the ayat with version eyes. So this is a cognitive bias that we have to really pay attention to. Unfortunately, most of the books of tafsir, if not all, and all of the books of translations fell into this type of cognitive bias that is called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when you enter into an, a task or an enterprise and you're thinking ahead of time as to what you're going to find. And then sure enough, you start seeing the evidence that confirms your prior conviction, your preconceived notion, even though the text really may be talking about something else. This is called confirmation bias. This is one of the biases that we've talked about in the last two episodes when we talked about Iblis. Iblis is the collection of all the cognitive biases that we suffer from. And therefore, this is just one example. So since I tackled this ayah, I'm going to give you the translation without any confirmation bias, without any bias, hopefully, inshallah. So we will read it again. Remember Zawj. We define Zawj when we were talking about the story of Adam is the counterpart, not necessarily a female, masculine, feminine kind of relationship. It is just another counterpart, another element in a pair of some sort. The pair might be defined in many, many different ways of relating the two elements within that pair. So, زَوْجَهَا لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا فَلَمَّا تَغَشَّاهَا حَمَلَتْ حَمْلًا خَفِيفًا فَمَرَّتْ بِهِ فَلَمَّا أَفْقَلَتْ دَعَوَا اللَّهَ رَبَّهُمَا لَإِنْ آتَيْتَنَا صَالِحًا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ فَلَمَّا آتَاهُمَا صَالِحًا جَعَلَا لَهُ شُرَكَاءَ فِيمَا آتَاهُمَا فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ عَمَّا يُشْرِكُونَ Now, before we start, I want to assure you that the word زَوْج, as we defined it before, exactly in relationship to the one nafs, to the single type of nafs, relates to Iblis, the counterpart of our own nafs, which is a part of our own nafs, so to speak. So we discussed this before, and we're going to apply this to this ayah. I also want to draw your attention that 
I did another translation of another ayah that is very similar. He has created out of it its counterpart. Here, ja'ala minha zawjaha. We're going to see the difference because in two different ayah, ja'ala minha zawjaha, in another ayah that we already translated, khalaqa minha zawjaha. So let's see the difference. I also want to bring to your attention the principle of relevance. When we read the interpretations or the translations by Muhsin Khan and Muhammad Asad, what did we learn about the pregnancy and the sexual relation between man and woman and all of that stuff? We really did not learn a whole lot. This is not ascribing to Allah and Allah's words their due reverence. So now we're going to apply the principle of relevance and dive deeper into the meaning and make sure we understand that there is something very essential in such ayah. So the translation goes, He, meaning Allah, is the one who created you from a single feminine nafs. Min nafsin wahidatin wa ja'ala minha. This pronoun is a feminine pronoun, which tells us clearly that it's referring to nafs. Linguistically, in Arabic, every word, as you know, every word is either masculine or feminine in general. But nafs is a feminine word, feminine term, feminine noun. It doesn't mean nafs itself is feminine. It's just linguistically, it is treated as a feminine. So from a single feminine nafs and embedded in it, embedded in it, وَجَعَلَ minha Of it, meaning of the same kind or of same nature, its masculine counterpart, زَوْجَهَا, masculine, to conciliate itself to it, meaning for the counterpart to conciliate or to reconcile itself or to yield itself to the nafs. In other words, the counterpart should be subservient to the nafs. That's what it means, لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا To find peace, tranquility in how it directs him. In other words, in how the nafs directs a zawj. However, when the counterpart acted as a blinder for nafs, تغشاها, from the word غشاوه, which is something that blinds, or a blinder, like a blanket that covers you and you cannot see what's above you. So when the counterpart acted as a blinder for nafs, i.e. constrained it intellectually and cognitively, it cannot see clearly anymore and therefore it cannot perceive, it cannot reflect, it cannot do its intellectual work properly. It, meaning the nafs, conceived of light concepts. Hamalat hamlan khafifan. Conceived of light concepts, meaning shallow, vain, superficial type of understanding. And this occurred several times. Famarrat bihi. The word marra is used in the Quran whenever there is more than once. Whenever you have a chance for something to occur more than once, the Quran uses the verb marra or marratun. So it happened or it occurred several times. But when its load became heavier, they both supplicated to Allah. What does that mean? Its load became heavier. It became harder to understand what's going on. These concepts, these light, vain, superficial concepts are no longer sufficient. So the nafs suddenly wakes up, suddenly realizes there's something wrong. As most of you have already indicated in your beautiful comments and emails to me. You reached a point, just like me, where we can no longer tolerate the vain, useless type of interpretations. We have to assume that Allah is indicating or saying or telling us something a lot more relevant than what the books of tafsir and the interpretations and the books of translation gave us. So when its load became heavier, they both supplicated to Allah. Who is both? And nafs was zawj. And that's why you remember I said Iblis is not an enemy of Allah. Iblis was not cursed by Allah. The responsibility for leading people to being cursed is upon you, meaning you could mislead people to become dissociated from the divine guidance. But it doesn't mean that Iblis himself is a bad actor. It's just part of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned Iblis, as we said before, 
Iblis is part of our ability to learn. And therefore, if we are going to learn independently, by definition, some of the things, some of the decisions, some of the opinions may be wrong, may be misleading us. And therefore, we lead or mislead ourselves away from the divine guidance. But when the nafs takes control over a zawj, counterpart, Iblis, as we saw in here, لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا to conciliate itself or himself as zawj to it, to the nafs. The nafs should be in control. That means now a nafs figured out that the load must be much heavier than this. They both supplicated to Allah together. So now Iblis, which is part of our learning, recognizes that there is something missing and therefore we need to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Lord of both of them, Rabbahuma, Rabbahuma, right here. Da'awa Allah, Rabbahuma, together. If you allow us to learn some of your divine terminology, la'in ataytana salihan. The verb ata in the Quran is constantly used to mean to allow to learn. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this verb with messengers, with prophets. He allowed them to learn. لَإِنْ آتَيْتَنَا صَالِحًا If you allow us to learn, what? صَالِحًا Remember, صَالِحًا, we talked about this. It's derived from the gerund صَلَحَ In common Arabic, we use the word مُصْطَلَح In the Quranic Arabic, Quran uses the word صَالِح which means terminology. So if you teach us the terminology, لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ What does that mean? لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ we shall become of those who communicate properly with you. I know the Arabic speaking brothers who are watching right now are probably confused or questioning my ability to understand. The word shakara or shukur in the Quran does not mean thankfulness. It is not what we think it means. The word shukur in the Quran is the proper communication with the angels and with Allah using the Abrahamic locution, using the Quranic divine lexicon. And therefore, here a nafs, a nafs plus its counterpart, Iblis, which is part of us, are both supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, teach us the proper terminology, teach us the divine lexicon, so that we could communicate properly with you, Allah. Now the next ayah. But when he, Allah, allowed them to learn some terminology, فَلَمَّا آتَاهُمَا صَالِحًا They both ascribed partners to Allah for what he alone had allowed them to learn. Ah, now we understand. So after learning the terminology, they start taking credit on their own for this. And they associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could be that they learned it through divine guidance direct to them. Or it could be that they learned it through somebody else. And therefore, they take that somebody else, like Dr. Hani or somebody else, as an intermediary between themselves and Allah. They associate. And this ayah is teaching us and teaching me, teaching all of you, no intermediaries. The guidance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't matter what any teacher says, what any book says, what any correct or incorrect translation says. If Allah does not give you the ability to learn through direct guidance, you don't learn anything. You will read it or you will hear it. As some, unfortunately, of the audience members for this channel, they say we don't understand or we don't agree or we refuse to accept. We refuse to accept the evidence or worse, we refuse to accept the conclusions you have reached. That's fine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who deposits the acceptance, the guidance the divine guidance into your heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, when Allah allows you to learn, don't give credit to anybody else. And that's why I keep saying, this ilm is not from me. I am simply the conduit. I'm only putting it in front of you to the extent that I can, to the extent that I can communicate with you, hopefully properly, hopefully faithfully. If I fail, it's my fault. If I succeed, Insha'Allah, you will give credit to Allah alone, not to Dr. Hani, not to YouTube, not to Sheikh Google, not to any other book you may read by me or by anybody else. Allah is the source 
of guidance. Remember this. So this ayah is reminding us, don't ascribe partners to Allah. So we continue. They both ascribe partners to Allah for what He alone had allowed them to learn. Meaning it's not your own intellectual prowess or strength or discipline or your hard work. It's none of that. It's Allah who allowed you to learn and give credit to Allah by saying first, Alhamdulillah. Second, by using this terminology that you just learned to make shukur, to communicate with Allah through supplication, through learning other parts of the Quran, etc. Now, what happens when they did this, when they ascribe partners to Allah for what Allah has allowed them to learn? Thus, after that, Allah became aloof for them. What does that mean? Allah started to make them feel that Allah is distant, high, ta'ala. He became higher and higher away from them. And they became lower and lower toward the superficial layer of the scripture. This is what the word ta'ala means. And this is extremely important. I just dropped a bomb. You should be shocked to learn what the word ta'ala here means. So why do I say ta'ala means that way? First, you need to pay attention to this letter fa. This letter fa is the conclusion type of junction between two sentences. So the first sentence is the cause. The second sentence is the effect. So the effect of what they did and thus Allah became aloof to them or aloof for them due to what they associate with him. An ma yushrikun because of what they have associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's dive into this a little bit more. In order to understand the word ta'ala, we have to understand the opposite of it. The opposite of it in the Quran is nazzala or tanazzala, such as in Surah Al-Qadr 97, Surah 97. We all know the Surah. I've done a full segment about this as part of the series during this past Ramadan regarding Laylatul Qadr. This is only one part of it. Tanazzalu al-malaikatu wal-ruhu fiha. During it, meaning Laylatul Qadr, the angels subserviently impart unto you and with them the divine message, meaning a ruh the divine message. Remember, a ruh does not mean spirit, does not mean soul. As they told us, the Quran is very clear. A ruh is the divine message. So what is this ayah saying? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us during Laylatul Qadr, which is one of 365 nights during the year, every night could be Laylatul Qadr. And we will talk a lot more about this, inshallah, in future segments, hopefully not in the far too distant future. Tanazzalu al-malaikatu, that means the angels subserviently, automatically obey what they were commanded to do, which is to impart upon you or unto you and with them the divine message, meaning they bring you the revelation in explaining the divine message and giving you the divine message directly. Yes, revealing to you information, an aha kind of idea, an understanding that refreshes you, that enlivens you, that brings you back to really close certainty in relating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the permission of their Lord. Of course, nothing happens without the permission of Allah concerning every relevant issue or concept. And therefore, tanazzalu is the opposite of ta'ala. Ta'ala is to become aloof in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no longer sends you the angels to reveal to you these new ideas and these new concepts and understanding of what the divine message is all about. I hope this makes sense. This is such a beautiful concept. But the dangerous part is that when we say subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to be careful because if we really don't understand and we think this is a supplication or coming closer to Allah, it's not. It is explaining that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can become distant from us. He doesn't become distant physically. You understand what I mean. We become so much far away from the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided us to. And therefore we appear as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has become aloof, distant, away from us. Allah wants us to remember 
that Allah is very close to us. Wherever you are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. If you choose to communicate properly with him, if you start ascribing to yourself, to your intellect, to Dr. Hani, to this shaykh, to that scholar, to whoever you read from or you learn from, that they are guiding you, you're falling into this trap that these ayat are talking about. So now, just one last comment about this ayat. I want to remind you that nafs is a feminine, very clearly in here. Minha, minha, the feminine pronoun. Zawjaha is a masculine noun. And therefore, now when we go to the next ayat, we're going to understand them very clearly, including a part or a sentence in an ayah that has baffled the scholars for 1400 years. And you're going to see how elegant, how beautiful the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are if we understand the concepts that are given in front of our own eyes. And if we learn from the Quran, we don't learn from the Arab poets. So what is shaitan's strategy? We discuss a key paragraph from Surah 4, Surah An-Nisa. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا I want to read one ayah at a time and really dive into it. So I hope you're patient, you're focused. Please take notes. Take a break if you need to, but stay with me. This is so critical, especially this part of Surah An-Nisa. Allah does not re-establish a direct connection with him when shirk is being committed, meaning associating with Allah, as we just saw in the prior ayah that we just read. And barring shirk, he re-establishes a direct connection with him to whoever chooses. To whoever chooses. If you choose, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that direct connection. There are conditions. What is the most important condition? Avoiding shirk. Avoiding shirk. Yes, we just saw in this prior ayah. So this is a very important concept of shirk that most people are not even aware of. We learn from Allah and we learn through the preserved scripture that Allah has given us. The Quran, the beautiful, eloquent and elegant book that has been preserved as a gift to me and to you, to all mankind. Alhamdulillah. So the very first important thing is if you fall into shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not re-establish a direct connection with you. So why do you say, Dr. Hani, yaghfir, meaning to re-establish a direct connection? The word ghafara or the verb ghafara in Arabic means to repair or to fix or to make something useful or to make something usable. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow you to repair your connection with him if you are committing shirk at the present time. What does that mean? That means you have to first look inward and ask yourself, am I purely seeking the guidance from Allah? Or am I seeking the guidance from such companion or such Ibn or such Abu or this book or that book? You have to ask yourself these questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not provide this direct connection to anyone who is not purely connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, what about other than that? If you choose, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may re-establish his direct connection if you avoid, fully avoid shirk, this type of shirk that we're talking about. Of course, there are many different types of shirk. And inshallah, in the future, we will talk about different types. But this one is so important because it touches la ilaha illallah. There is no source of divine guidance for any of creation, any part of creation, except Allah, the one, the only. So therefore, this is the most important aspect of avoiding shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, and whoever associates with Allah has gone far astray without knowing it. Why do I say without knowing it? فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا Whenever you have this pattern, dalla dalalan, there is something unusual about the combination of the two words. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said, 
فقد ضل كثيرا فقد ضل بعيدا all of those would work but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ضل ضلالا to draw your attention that there is something unusual going on in here what is the unusual thing the person who is committing shirk very often doesn't know it and therefore how far astray he goes he's not aware of it فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا very far so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting you to seek to re-establish this connection with him. The condition, avoid shirk, especially in ascribing authoritativeness regarding the guidance. The guidance only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope this is clear. So now we continue with the next ayah, and this is the one that is problematic for most, if not all, of the scholars. إِنْ يَدْعُونَ مِنْ دُونِهِ إِلَّا إِنَاثًا وَإِنْ يَدْعُونَ إِلَّا شَيْطَانًا مَرِيدًا such people supplicate to worship nothing but the feminine. Oh, what is the feminine? What well, it's the nafs. It's the nafs. Is it one? No, multiple nafs. So any human being is described as nafs. Nafs. So therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing us to the feminine in this ayah, he's pointing us to the nafs or amphus, yours or somebody else or many such people. So those who worship or supplicate or seek information or attach themselves to anfus or nafs, yours or others, you are supplicating or worshiping the feminine selves. That's what it means. And they supplicate to worship nothing but to a masculine rebellious shaitan. Why do I say masculine? Because shaitan is a noun that's masculine. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that nafs or the bad part that we worship sometimes is a female or females are bad. I'm not saying any of this. Don't carry my words to mean something I did not say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing inath to represent nafs, which is a feminine noun. And this is part of the methodology of the Quran. You understand over time that the Quran talks about itself, talks about its language. So when it's talking about inath, it's talking about the feminine nouns. So this is what is referred to in this ayah. Now we continue. لَعَنَهُ الله. Who? لَعَنَهُ الله. Whom Allah has cursed. Meaning shaitan has been cursed by Allah. We're going to see more detail. Notice Iblis was never cursed directly by Allah. He says upon you is the responsibility of the curse or getting people to be cursed. Meaning to be distanced away from divine guidance. But shaitan is directly cursed. He is the one who is cursed. He shall be blocked and blocking access to the divine guidance. لَعَنَهُ اللَّهُ وَقَالَ لَأَتَّخِذَنَّ مِنْ عِبَادِكَ نَصِيبًا مَفْرُوضًا And he said, he meaning Allah in here, just be patient, I know you're surprised. He, Allah, said to shaitan, I shall assign from among your worshippers, ibadika, a determined portion with different roles and statuses. Hmm. What do you mean your worshippers? What do you mean your worshippers? People worship shaitan? Of course they worship shaitan. Read, if you will, in Surah Maryam, which we're going to cover in a few pages, inshallah, in this presentation, where Ibrahim السلام, was talking to his father. And he says, Ya Abati, la ta'budi shaitan. There are people who worship shaitan. What is shaitan? We're going to see in more details. So, therefore, shaitan has his own ibad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling shaitan, I shall take or I shall assign from among your worshippers a determined portion. This is where the ayah finished. Nasiban mafruda. So, what is this referring to? Well, it's referring to two things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assign part of the worshippers of shaitan to remain with shaitan permanently. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assign part or a portion of the worshippers of shaitan to come out of worshipping the shaitan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it open to make us think. Is it a permanent condition to be a worshipper of shaitan? To be ibad as shaitan? And the answer, because the ayah did not specify, it allows for the possibility of both. 
So we're going to see more detail, inshallah. I promise you, just stay with us all the way to the end of this segment and you're going to be amazed and very pleased, inshallah, at what you learn. So we continue with, this, with the next part of this paragraph. Here's the same pattern again. So let's translate it very carefully, very slowly, so that you follow one step at a time. This is really critical. This is the whole strategy laid out by shaitan to teach us how he acts, how he behaves, what his objective is. Now, before we go into the translation, I want to tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَعَنَهُ Allah, Allah cursed him, shaitan. وَقَالَ This is Allah speaking. Why do I know it's Allah speaking? Because the style, when you get used to the Quran, you understand that the letter wow does not come when there's a shift. If there is a shift, meaning the shaitan responded, the Quran would have said, فَقَالَ or قَالَ etc. or change of ayah. You jump into a different context. But here in the same ayah, وَقَالَ that means it's continuing. So this is clearly Allah saying to shaitan, as we just saw. The next ayah splits what seems to be a continuation of the same discourse. But ah, it's not the same continuation of the discourse. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breaks the same seeming discourse into two different ayat, that means something changed. Either the speaker changed or the person who is being addressed changed or he's drawing our attention to some change. Therefore, by breaking this discourse between ayah 118 and 119, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us something changed in here. What changed is the speaker. The speaker here is shaitan. So in this part, وَقَالَ لَأَتَّخِذَنَّ مِنْ عِبَادِكَ نَصِيبًا مَفْرُوضًا This was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing shaitan. The next one, Shaitan is in return replying. How do we know this? Because as I said, this is the style of the Quran. There is a reason why ayats are split into. We've given you several bayinat in the past. This is a new bayina that you've never heard before. We're going to see this clearly in the story of Yusuf or the story of Musa. In many other places, inshallah, you will become more accustomed to this style. But whenever there is a seeming discourse, that is broken, cut, split into two ayat, that means something changed. Don't assume it's the same speaker. So therefore, what is shaitan saying? He's saying, in return, in return, wa, and therefore, after what you just said, I'm going to do the following. I shall mislead them, la'udillannahum, and I shall appease them with wishful thinking, la'umanniyannahum, and upon my command, they shall incapacitate the ears of the herds. I will give them the command. Upon my command, what are they going to do? They will incapacitate the ears of the herds. An'am, we've talked about this. An'am is a metaphorical reference as part of the Abrahamic locution that refers to people who follow as a herd. They follow ijma', they follow the group think mentality. Herds, an'am, this is the word that's used in the Abrahamic locution to refer to such people. So what does that mean? They shall incapacitate the ears of the herds. Remember in the last two segments, we've talked about the ability to hear. Whenever a sama' is mentioned in the Quran, very often, it is referring to receiving the divine message through our ears, through our ability to listen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the divine guidance being given to us through the ears. We will see a lot more inshallah, but for now, this is just a general reference and we will continue more details inshallah in future segments. Is shaitan going to do it on his own? No, shaitan is going to order or command certain human beings to cause the herds to stop listening to Allah. 
So what does that mean? Shaitan is interested in teaching you that Allah is mute. He doesn't speak to us. He doesn't communicate with us. Allah is not mute. Allah can speak to us anytime he chooses, especially if we fulfill the conditions that he told us about in the Quran. So shaitan wants us to think that Allah is aloof, that Allah does not communicate with us, that we cannot communicate directly with Allah. The Quran teaches us, no, that's not true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the direct guidance and the divine messages and the explanations and will correct and fix our Weltanschung as we saw in prior segments. And we're going to discuss it a little bit more here today, inshallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us all the time. And he's talking to us if we choose to listen. Listening is the ears. The ears can be incapacitated by those who worship shaitan. So when they tell you you're not worthy of receiving fresh understanding or new direct guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tell them you shut up. Allah is not mute. Don't tell me that Allah cannot talk to me. Allah promised us in the Quran that he could talk to us if he chooses and if we fulfill the conditions. So upon my command, they shall incapacitate the ears of the herds, people who follow blindly. And upon my command, they shall change Allah's creation. What is Allah's creation? Well, it's the whole universe, including the Quran he gave us, the text of the Quran, of course, because the content is not in the text. The content or the understanding, the samawat are not in the scripture. So the scripture itself, the text that's written on paper, that's created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, of course. Because the samawat, his knowledge, his understanding that he gives you is infinite. It cannot be contained by a book. And therefore, his understanding, his ilm, his knowledge is not in the text. The text is but an instrument through which you receive a samawat or the understandings or the layers of comprehension that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make available to you. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the creation we said Al-Kitab Al-Mastur, the written book, Wal-Kitab Al-Manshur, the universe, the physical, dynamic, alive universe all around us. Humans can change such creation, of course. But here Shaitan is specifically focused, as we will see, on those who deal or engage with the scripture. So therefore the worshippers of Shaitan are going to be instructed by Shaitan to change. Change what? Change how the Quran is interpreted. Change the lexicon. Change the vocabulary. Change the Abrahamic locution or hide it. All of these changes are part of changing the scripture, changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever takes shaitan as his patron has indeed been defeated, a manifest defeat without knowing it, as we said before. فَقَدْ خَسِرَ خُسْرَانًا مُبِينًا Now we continue. يَعِدُهُمْ وَيُمَنِّيهِمْ وَمَا يَعِدُهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا Shaitan promises them and placates them with wishful thinking. But what shaitan promises them is but a delusion. A delusion. It is lies. It is fake comfort. It is not real. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides the guidance don't allow anyone to tell you you're not authorized to access direct guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope the theme is starting to become very clear what shaitan is trying to do. The strategy is laid out fully in front of our eyes. This is exactly what shaitan is trying to do. Now the conclusion, Those people, meaning who? The worshippers of shaitan and the followers of the worshippers of shaitan. Those who insist that guidance comes from such and such book, or such and such sheikh, or such and such companion, or the early generations. All of those people who make these claims are worshipping shaitan. And the Quran is very clear, and I feel fully confident in attributing such an accusation against them, because Allah is teaching us, this is their tricks, this is their approach. And shaitan is very happy with them. 
The proof, watch the current status of the Ummah today and you will understand for yourself where such thinking has led us. Those people dwell in Jahannam. We talked about Jahannam before. We're going to talk about it a lot more. I'm not going to get into it today. But this is a common term that's used also for Iblis. So Iblis can lead to Jahannam. We talked about the seven gateways. And Shaitan is also interested in the same thing. And can do the same thing against us. And they shall find no way to escape it. Why? Because they block the divine guidance from Allah. They don't want to listen to Allah. How are they going to get out of Jahannam? If they don't listen to Allah, they refuse to accept that Allah can communicate. So it's a disastrous situation that they lock themselves into. They stay in Jahannam. They shall find no way to escape it. I want you to notice something very important. In Ayah 117, there are two negation type of statements. And they're really important to pay attention to. I'm going to use a little bit of propositional logic in here to explain this. But please stay with me. It's really very simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, إِنْ يَدْعُونَ مِنْ دُونِهِ إِلَّا إِنَاثًا They worship or supplicate to nothing but the feminine selves. And we said this refers to oneself or to other selves, meaning other human beings. Therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us they only worship or supplicate to such human beings, this is an exclusion. So everything else is negated and the only confirmation is this one item, which is the self or the selves. I hope it's clear. So everything else is excluded from this sentence. Now, he's going to give us another sentence with the exact same composition and he's going to change the description of everything included. So, وَإِنْ يَدْعُونَ إِلَّا شَيْطَانًا marida. They worship nothing. Everything else is excluded except shaitan. So on one hand, we have nafs or anfus, which is included in what they supplicate, the only thing that's included. On another hand, we have shaitan, which is the only thing that's included. So everything else is excluded. This is not what's called in mathematics a union. This is called an equivalent statement. So the two statements are saying exactly the same thing using descriptions of the same item that is included. So what is included? Shaitan and inath, meaning nafs. So therefore, shaitan is nafs or part of nafs. This is the mathematical reduction based on propositional logic to what you just read. So basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using advanced mathematics. Yes, abstract algebra. Yes, but it's very important that we take it seriously and we understand it as I just described. So Allah is excluding everything else except inath, the nafs, the selves. And Allah is excluding everything else except shaitan. And they're the same sentence describing the same group of people with this minor change in the description. That means these two items are one and the same. This is what it means in abstract math. So I hope you accept this if you don't know abstract math. If you know abstract math, you're going to find it fascinating and amazing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to understand it this way, this clearly. Why is this so important? Because the next topic that we're going to dive into relates shaitan to nafs. So now we're going to see more evidence that shaitan is really part of our nafs. Shaitan is really part of the human composition. It is not something out there. We're going to see it in more detail. Last time in the last segment, before closing the segment, we talked about Surah An-Nas, Surah 114. I hope you have watched the very long last segment. I know two hours and 45 minutes and you were very patient. Most of you are very brave. Wallahi, I would not have gotten into such a segment. But I am so amazed and impressed by all of you who watched all the way to the end. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of people, the sovereign of people, the deity for people, from the evil of the defeatable whisperer, Al-Khannas. Al-Khannas, I was asked about this in one of the comments. 
Al Khannas is from the verb Khanasa, which means to retreat. So Khannas is the one who retreats. He's willing to be defeated. He's defeatable. He's easily kicked out. So we have to remember this. So Al Waswas is a noun that describes the active participle of the verb waswasa. We're going to see more details about this. It refers to shaitan, as we will see. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, say, I seek refuge in Allah, basically all of these first three ayat, from the shaitan who whispers bad things or intimates negative thoughts, but he's very defeatable, al-khannas, alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudur nas He intimates into what's within the breasts from among jinn and people. Min al jinnati wa nas This ayah right here proves that al waswas who does waswasa is from jinna and nas. In other words, from the jinn and from people. And we said jinn is a type of people. And therefore, the only logical conclusion is that shaitan is part of people. In other words, it's a descriptor for certain people. It describes certain states among certain people. So I hope this is clear. We're going to give even more evidence. Just stay tuned and stay with me, inshallah, and you were going to see it. Other than Surah 114, the verb waswasa occurs in three other ayat. It occurs in ayah 720 and 20, 120, both of them related to shaitan. It occurs in Surah An Nas 114. And it occurs in ayah 50, 16. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ Very clear. A nafs is the one that does waswasa. So waswasa is either shaitan or nafs. They're the same. They're one and the same. So shaitan is part of a nafs. There's no other way to interpret all of this evidence that I just gave you. And like I said, the verb waswasa only occurs in these four places. And it's very consistent, very clear marking. If you remember the definition of markings among the various paragraphs of the Quran. But there is more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us another marking. Sawwala. The verb sawwala. Watch this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Muhammad. I'm sorry, I'm not going to translate it because the time is relatively short and I want to keep moving forward. In Surah 25, Ayah 47, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a certain group of people who rejected after being Muslims. And he says, Ash-shaytanu sawwala lahum. Shaytan has legitimated their actions to them. Shaytan sawwala lahum. For them. In Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about the story of As-Samiri. As-Samiri who helped the people of Musa develop Al-Ijl. If you remember the story after the Exodus, we will get into it a lot more in detail, inshallah, in the future. He says, using the locution of those people, وَكَذَلِكَ سَوَّلَتْ لِي نَفْسِي The same verb, sawwala, except he's attributing this verb, sawwala, to himself. Nafsi, myself. So myself did the legitimation to myself. Is that enough? No, there is more. There's a lot more as a matter of fact, but I'm only going to give you three examples just to convince you that shaitan and nafs are part of the same thing. And we're going to see exactly what that implies when we come to the concept of qareen. And you're going to be amazed that most scholars, unfortunately, missed this beautiful and clear evidence right in front of us. In Surah Yusuf, Yaqub is talking to his children after they brought the shirt that is bloodied and stained with blood. And Yaqub told them, no, you lied and sawwalat lakum anfusukum. Yourselves have legitimated the bad things that you've done. So the self and the shaitan are the only two subjects using the verb sawwala in the Quran. I hope it's clear. So now there's an obvious question. Does our nafs act against us? Of course, of course. In Surah An-Naml, the queen of Sheba is reported to have said, Inni dhalamtu nafsi. I have oppressed or transgressed against myself. I and myself. So therefore, 
it is presented as if they're two items, but they're really one and the same. In Surah Al-Qasas, Musa السلام, said, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي I have transgressed against myself. And many, many other ayat report to us that the nafs transgresses or acts against the best interest of itself. And this is very obvious from reading the Quran. Anyone who understands the basic concepts of the Quran will find this very, very reasonable and easy to understand. So now we move to remind you of a few concepts from the series that we've done on Surah Abasa. If you have not watched that series, I promise you it's phenomenal. It's really important and it lays out the foundations for so many different things. Please go back and watch that series in full and you'll be amazed inshallah. Three important terms or three important concepts that I need to refresh your memory with. The first concept is the concept of dhikra. dhikra and this is different than tadkira. And we talked about that in detail in that series. But basically to remind you, dhikra is to remember or to receive a spontaneous, sudden appearance in one's mind of an answer to a question that was asked earlier, especially a question that relates to the Quran or to interpreting and engaging the Quran. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deposits the divine guidance, it doesn't become immediately available to you. Sometimes it takes a while when you become ready, it pops. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates that idea to come into your consciousness. That sudden appearance, which I refer to as the aha moment, as you're engaging the Quran, that's called dhikra. That's different than tadhkira. Tadhkira is a remembrance using your human memory. Dhikra is not about human memory. Dhikra is about recalling spontaneously something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deposited into the qalb, into the core, not the heart, the core. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that term to mean something very specific. This is precise terminology that's part of the divine lexicon. Unfortunately, all the books of tafsir, all the books of interpretation and translation missed the distinction between dhikra and tadhkira. You will see inshallah more detail as we proceed. So where does dhikra come from? It's a recollection that comes from the qalb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear. Again, we're going to detail a lot more of these concepts. I'm just reminding you that we covered this in prior segments. The repository that contains our Weltanschung is Al-Qalb. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels have direct access to our Qalb. Al-Qalb. So for that, if you really want to learn more, refer to a segment called does God sit on a throne where we discuss the Weltanschung, Al-Arsh, all of these details, inshallah, you will find more information there. So while we're at it, let's discuss the verb Ya'qilun or Aqala, which is used in the Quran significantly frequently. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this verb to relate to Qulub. So in Ayah 2246, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارٌ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبٌ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Would they not journey through the scripture? And thus, remember, Al-Ard is the scripture, the actual scriptural text. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is metaphorically saying, go walk through the scriptural text, the Ard. And thus the question why would they not have cores with which they confine themselves? Confine themselves from what? From straying into misguidance, from straying into confusion, into the wrong ways of thinking and approaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the heart is described in here with the verb يعقلون, which means to confine themselves, to restrict themselves from making mistakes. We're going to see more detail if we go into the linguistic derivation. So the original linguistic meaning of the verb aqala or the gerund or the root aqala is to tie with a rope, literally to tie with a rope. So they use that verb when they tie a camel, for example, or they tie any animal or a prisoner. They use the word aqala, the traditional Arabic headdress that's currently even today used by people in the Gulf region. 
that they put over their scarf is called the iqal, which is a rope-like thing that's used as a decorative thing over the head. The term aql, by the way, as a noun, never occurs in the Quran. The term aql does not mean reason or rational thinking. Don't let anyone confuse you about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never used the word noun aql in the Quran. There is no aql in accordance to the Quran. Aqala is to restrict, to tie, to limit one from going astray. So therefore, ya'qilun is to help us contain ourselves from making mistakes. What is the function that is assigned to the core, to the qalb? It's aqala, ya'qilun. That's what the meaning of the word ya'qilun. It does not mean let your rational thinking or your reason reign supreme over everything else. As we saw in the last two segments, your rational thinking comes with a possible negative side effect called Iblis, and therefore it could mislead you. So now we continue with one more question. Is it strange not to sense the Qalb? You know, we have a Qalb, the Quran talks about this. It is not the heart, it's not the muscle that pumps the blood. We don't know what's the relationship between the Quranic term Qalb and what the Arabs call Qalb, which is the muscle that pumps blood. There might be a direct relationship, there might not be. Some advanced scientific research is going on right now to analyze the full nervous system that is associated with the actual muscle, the heart. But we don't want to go there because the Quran did not give us these details, at least as far as I could discern by doing the analysis on the word Qalb. So the word Qalb for now, we translate it as the core, the repository of our Weltanschung, of our basis of knowledge. So, is it weird not to feel or to sense the presence of Qalb? And of course, no. You don't feel, you don't sense how your kidneys operate right now as we speak. You don't sense how your muscles, when you run, request extra oxygen from the blood, from the heart, and the heart responds. You don't feel or sense when you eat certain food how your pancreas excretes extra fluids to help deal with the type of food you just ate. So many things happen within our subconscious functions within our body without us sensing it. So this is not really strange. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing this information to us indicates that Allah is granting us more knowledge than what we can sense with our five senses. I hope this makes sense. So now we continue inshallah moving on a little bit to touch on Iblis and motivate our further thinking about Shaitan. I want to remind you that we discussed this surah, Surah Al-A'raf, in relationship to Iblis in the last two segments in full details. And we said this was the beginning of the strategy of Iblis. And we said that Iblis talked about your right hands and your left hands and in front of you all four dimensions were mentioned in this paragraph from Surat Al-A'raf and you see the translation in front of you if you want to refresh your memory but as I said it was discussed fully in the prior two segments. So now we move to some motivating questions that help us think about shaitan. First question is Okay, so Iblis is taking care of these four dimensions, four directions. In front of you, meaning whatever is in your hands, you can read about the past, about knowledge that was acquired from prior people. From behind you, we said the posterity. So that's two directions, two dimensions. Okay, from the right hand, beyond the right hand, and we said this is the fake piety. And we said from beyond the left hand, which we refer to as the excess wickedness that we're all liable to fall into. So Iblis is going to move us in one or more of these four dimensions. The question is, what about the additional two dimensions we have above us and below us? Iblis is off limit to that. Hmm. So who is tasked with blocking these two additional dimensions? Guess who? It starts with the letter SH. All right, we're going to see more. 
The other question is, when we read the story of Adam, and we're going to translate the rest of the ayat 36 through 39, we find that shaitan was with them in Jannah. What was he doing there? I thought shaitan was not allowed in Jannah, as per the traditional interpretation. But the ayah clearly tells us that shaitan was with Adam and his counterpart. What was he doing in Jannah? I think you already know the answer because I already told you that shaitan is part of the nafs. So shaitan is not a separate entity, it's part of the nafs. We're going to keep elaborating this concept further and further, even with illustrations and diagrams. I promise you, it's very interesting what's coming. Another question is, why was shaitan cursed by Allah, but not Iblis? Another question is, what is shaitan's strategy or objective? We've talked about some of them already. Is there a guaranteed weapon against shaitan? Again, we're going to discuss some of these questions as we continue this segment. So I hope we stay together, inshallah, and you continue with us. So before we go very far, let's do the linguistic analysis of the word or the term shaitan, shaitan. The term shaitan is derived from the morpheme, wizan or wazan, fa'lan, fa'lan. And the, f- and the morpheme, fa'lan, indicates an active participle, ism fa'il, with some exaggeration. So he does this frequently, or he does this broadly, or he does this excessively. So this is the concept of this morpheme. So it's an active participle, an agent, someone who does, and he does so quite frequently or broadly. It is based on the gerund shayata, and this is a verb, this is an Arabic verb, shayata. It means to sear over the flame, or to separate, to cut off. And both are beautiful meanings because shaitan is the one who causes the searing over the flame. Remember annar as we described it, not annar as it was described in the Bible. And he causes us to separate. Separate from what? Separate from the divine guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the paragraph from Surah An-Nisa, Surah 4, which we just covered a few minutes earlier. So here we have an example from Surah Al-Isra. We've talked about this a little bit before, so I'm going to go over it very quickly. وَجَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّةً أَنْ يَفْقَهُوهُ وَفِي آذَانِهِمْ وَقْرًا وَإِذَا ذَكَرْتَ رَبَّكَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ وَحْدَهُ وَلَّوْ عَلَىٰ أَدْبَارِهِمْ نُفُورًا And we have installed covers over their cores, and in their ears we have installed blockers, meaning they do not hear the divine guidance, and their cores, the qulub or qalb, do not receive such divine guidance and do not release the divine guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved within al-qalb. And when you mention your Lord in the Quran alone, we've talked about this in prior segments, the major interpreters and the books of tafsir and the translators, unfortunately, switch the order. They put alone before the Quran. No, alone is after the Quran. Fil Qur'ani wahdahu, alone after the Quran. In other words, if you're reciting or remembering your Lord strictly based on the Quran, exclusively, they don't like it. What happens to them? They turn away repulsed. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ ذُكِّرَ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِ فَأَعْرَضَ عَنْهَا وَنَسِيَ مَا قَدَّمَتْ يَدَهُ إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّةً إِنْ يَفْقَهُ وَفِي آذَانِهِمْ وَكْرًا وَإِنْ تَدْعُهُمْ إِلَى الْهُدَىٰ فَلَنْ يَهْتَدُوا إِذًا أَبَدًا And we have installed covers over their cores, the same concept, and in their ears, blockers, preventing them from hearing, from receiving the divine guidance. And if you invite them to receive the divine guidance, they shall not seek to be guided. Why? Their cores, their qalb are already covered up, and their ears are blocked, so they cannot receive any guidance, nor could they seek it, because it takes knowledge from the core, from the qalb, to go seek the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we ask an important question, what is the primary function of shaitan? What is his role? How does he work? And the answer, I'm going to give it to you, and then we're going to detail some ayat that discuss it. The primary functions of shaitan is twofold, to block dhikra and to block hearing, as we just saw in this ayat about these people. Shaitan wants us to not receive anything from the core, and shaitan wants to prevent us from receiving any direct 
guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the ears. So, ayah 668 from Surah Al-An'am. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ الَّذِينَ يَخُوضُونَ فِي آيَاتِنَا فَأَعْرِضْ عَنْهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُوضُوا فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِهِ وَإِمَّا يُنْسِيَنَّكَ الشَّيْطَانُ فَلَا تَقْعُدْ بَعْدَ الذِّكْرَى مَعَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ And when you see those who engage our signs in a vain discourse, meaning they are discussing the ayat in silly ways, in uneducated ways, in ignorant ways, vain, dissociate from them so that or until that they engage in a different type of discourse. وَإِمَّا يُنْسِيَنَّكَ الشَّيْطَانِ And if shaitan ever makes you forget, then do not sit after dhikra in the company of the transgressing people. So therefore now we understand one of the main functions of shaitan is to cause forgetfulness. Forgetfulness of what? Forgetfulness against dhikra. In other words, he doesn't want you to do anything that will lead to dhikra. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing us and instructing our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After dhikra, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nudges you with a freebie, with a gift, dhikra, don't sit with them anymore. Dissociate yourself from them. Remove yourself from that situation where you are exposed to, to such vain discourse. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, in Surah 26, number 212. وَمَا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ وَمَا تَنَزَّلَتْ وَمَا لَهُمْ وَمَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ This is dhikra. It's talking about the Quran. And we were never inequitable. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us that He's never inequitable? Because there's a choice you're going to see. There's a choice we make when we allow ourselves to worship shaitan, or we allow ourselves to accept the opinions of those who worship shaitan. And it was not the shaitans who made it repeatedly accessible. وَمَا تَنَزَّلَتْ بِهِ الشَّيَاطِينَ Shayateen or shaitan plural are not the ones who made it available to your heart, Muhammad, or to us as a divine message. And they are not suitable for that. They're not made for that. وَمَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُمْ It's not part of their makeup. وَمَا يَسْتَطِعُونَ Nor can they do this. In other words, shaitan never receives direct guidance. So if you're shaitan, if the part of nafs in you is preventing you from receiving divine guidance, you have to understand that it is probably... Shaitan has overtaken some aspects of your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Part of this is shirk as we said. And this is perhaps the most important part. So if there is a shaitan in the nafs, you cannot receive dhikra. This is even worse. They are blocked or they're sequestered from hearing. Hearing what? Receiving the direct guidance into the core. And finally, just to confirm the same concept of forgetfulness or causing forgetfulness by shaitan. In Surah Yusuf, وَقَالَ الَّذِي ظَنَّ أَنَّهُ نَاجٍ مِّنْهُ مَذْكُرْنِي عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ فَأَنْسَاهُ الشَّيْطَانُ ذِكْرَ رَبِّهِ This is talking about the friend of Yusuf who came out of prison earlier than Yusuf. And as I told you in prior segments, he had become a Muslim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about this in many, many different ways. We will deal with it. Inshallah, when we talk about the surah of Yusuf, the important thing is Yusuf asked him to bring out the information that he gave him and to make da'wah. So shaitan made him forget the dhikr of his master. In other words, what he learned from Yusuf. So we continue, inshallah, what is shaitan? Now we give the clear definition. I hope you're paying attention. If you're tired or you're not focused, please wake up. And stay with me. This is very important. Shaitan is a part of an insan. Specifically, insan. Every directly guidable person. Remember, I didn't say directly guided. Directly guidable. He's qualified. He's a candidate for receiving the direct guidance. Insan. We talked about this in the prior segment. Who chooses, chooses, underline chooses, deprivation from direct access to the divine guidance. How does he do this? 
either failure to receive the divine quenching ma from above, ma that's coming as the divine guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from above into the core, al-qalb, or failure to receive the spontaneous, involuntary recall of such guidance from where? From below, from below, from the core. So therefore now we have the two other directions or dimensions that Iblis missed. So who is in charge of these other two extra dimensions? It is Mr. Shaitan. It is part of our nafs that will take care of what Iblis could not do. So I hope you appreciate the irony and of course the important reference or metaphorical representation that is described by these six dimensions. So an insan who subscribes to the ways of shaitan becomes himself a shaitan, just like a bashar who succumbs to Iblis's strategy becomes a jinn himself. And we described this in full in the last two segments. Now the good news, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assures us in the Quran that both of these conditions, the condition of shaitan and the condition of jinn are reversible. If you commit to the organic Quranic methodology as we shall see more details. In other words, if you focus on making yourself disciplined, if you do al-ikhlas as we described it in the last segment, if you really avoid shirk as we described it a little earlier, you seek maghfirah to reconnect and repair your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both of these conditions are reversible. You can come out of it, but you have to start. You have to understand the diagnosis of your current condition and you have to work seriously and to take it seriously and to do it diligently, sincerely, patiently, submissively. Don't expect a time frame. Don't put conditions on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allow Allah to be the Lord. He knows when you're ready and stay with it. Stick with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prove your submissiveness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this reversal takes time, takes patience, takes effort, takes learning, takes diligence. More importantly, it takes sincerity and it takes rahmah from Allah. And you cannot put a time schedule on that. Allah knows when you're ready. As I said before, there were cases in my own personal life where a single ayah took me seven years of patiently working on it and revisiting it and trying to analyze it. And then after seven years, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed, allowed me to understand it, hopefully. So it takes time, be patient. I'm not saying this is going to happen over years, but over months perhaps, over weeks, just be patient and stay with the program. So now I want to move to remind you of a different aspect that we've covered in the past, which is Bashar versus Insan. I'm not going to go through the whole diagram again. I'm just going to put it up and remind you very quickly of the key components because we're going to develop the same diagram a little bit further, elaborate it, add more details to it. So to Allah, Bashar is every human being. Everyone is Bashar. Two, the people of Ba'uda, if you remember, we talked about this group from Bani Israel. They refer to themselves as insan, as a distinguishing mark, as a way to separate themselves above the rest of humanity. It's a way of supremacy to them. It's a code word to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the same word to ridicule them and to tell them, we know your code, but the insan as defined by Allah is directly guidable person, directly guidable human being. So insan is anyone who attaches himself, herself to a divine scripture by choice. I choose to follow the scripture. Some of them distinguish themselves as insan or ins to proclaim supremacy. That's not for Muslims. Muslims are bashar who seek div divine guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope this is very clear. We put up this diagram. This diagram includes the blue box that you see, the bigger blue box all around that includes all humans. Within it is ins or insan or amana. All of these terms we've defined before. They're people of scripture. That's all it means in the Quran. When it is referring to that group, the Ba'uda from Bani Israel, it is referring to them as a derogatory sort of label 
to tell them we know your secret, we know your code. Among al-Bashar and partly among al-Insan is a group called al-Muttaqun, the disciplined ones, especially the ones disciplined in engaging the Quran, engaging the last scripture, the preserved scripture from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And within that group is a select few Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as abrar, the totally faithful, loyal, dedicated ones. They are the ones who enjoy perfect dhikrah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us among al-abrar. We also talked about al-jinn, who's a group of people who embody iblis. That means they fall prey to iblis's strategy and they are not aware of all the cognitive errors and defects and biases that they suffer in their day-to-day -day thinking and decision-making. Among those, of course, are the atheists. And we said al-jinn is not strictly part of insan. Jinn can be part of Bashar too, and even if they don't attach themselves to a scripture. Now with this, we're going to move into a little bit more detail and lay out the expanded model about Bashar versus insan, versus jinn, iblis, shaitan, all of these things are included in this updated diagram, more expanded diagram. So hopefully it'll make sense. Again, please stay awake and focus because this is essential to really understand all of these different sets in the Quran and how the Quran relates to them and refers you to understand them. So the same thing, the blue box is Bashar, all mankind. Not all of them are muttaqun or abrar. Part of them are the ones right here in the light blue box, Insan or Amana or Bani Adam. They are people of scriptures, people who choose to attach themselves to a scripture, especially the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this is a special group. Of that group specifically, we have Muttaqun and Abrar. But as before, I didn't show it on this diagram, Muttaqun and Abrar could be from outside this group of Insan. So we cannot restrict Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from selecting a bashar who does not call themselves a follower or adherent to the Quran. We cannot restrict Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from choosing to make them among the muttaqun or abrar. So this diagram doesn't show it. The prior diagram shows it. Abrar and muttaqun could be from outside insan group, the people of scripture. Please be careful. Don't make that mistake. Don't put yourself in the seat of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and we leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make that decision. So now jinn is as we described before and shaitan is a new block in here. This is the brown block. Shaitan is strictly from among insan. Strictly. We're going to see. We're going to see in detail why we say this. Shaitan is not attributable to someone who is outside the group of insan, outside the group of people of scripture. Shaitan specifically is for insan. We're going to see more detail. So shaitan is an enemy of insan specifically. He does not allow dhikra. He is blocked from the divine guidance. So between muttaqun and the type of people called shaitan, there are many categories in between. So I didn't put a lot of additional details to keep it simple. Hopefully this makes sense and you will understand what we're referring to. Could shaitan be also part of jinn? Yes. Shayateen al-insi wal-jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran there are shaitan from among ins, this group right here, and from among jinn. So, of course, not from the jinn who are outside the light blue box. Only the jinn who are part of the light blue box. So I hope this makes sense. We will continue inshaAllah. I want to confirm to you that shaitan is specifically to mankind an enemy. We're going to detail it a little bit more, but this is a quick reference just to put your mind at ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Yusuf at the voice of Yaqub, when he's talking to Yusuf, he says, Inna shaitana lil insani aduwum mubin. Shaitan is specifically for insan a manifest enemy. Why do I say specifically? because of the structure of the sentence. So the Arabic allows a flipping of two words to focus on something before something else. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ عَدُوٌّ مُبِينٌ لِلْإِنسَانِ 
And that would be the average, regular, traditional way of making that sentence. So Lil Insan would have appeared right there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not do this. He moved this word Lil Insan and put it right after Shaitan before Adu. And when in Arabic you do this, you're bringing exclusivity to the term you brought forward. So it is especially or specifically for insan, a manifest enemy. I hope this makes sense. All right. So we continue, inshallah, back to the story of Adam. All of you have been waiting for this. Ayah 35, 36, and we will continue with 37, 38, 39 in the next page, inshallah. This is from Surah Al-Baqarah. وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ وَكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا وَلَا تَقْرَبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ فأزلهما الشيطان عنها فأخرجهما مما كان فيه وقلنا اهبطوا بعضكم لبعض عدو ولكم في الأرض مستقر ومتاع إلى حين And we said, this is Allah speaking, O Adam, persist you and your counterpart in Jannah. We've talked about this ayah before. I'm just iterating the translation for your reference. You and your counterpart should persist in Jannah, stay there and nourish yourself from it in abundance wherever you choose, you two choose, both of you. وَكُلَا مِنْهَا Both of you. You can eat or nourish yourself, sustain yourself. Of course, spiritual nourishment is what we're talking about. Wherever you choose, meaning from any other part that you choose, except, except one, do not go near this shajara, seeking knowledge from this group of argumentative deceivers. I talked about this in the last segment. Please go back to it if you have any doubt about this interpretation. Clearly, because of the context, He's talking about Ba'uda. We saw this in Ayah 26 of Surah Al-Baqarah, which preceded this paragraph. For then you will be among the transgressors like them. So, O Adam, persist you and your counterpart in Jannah. Nourish yourself, sustain yourself spiritually in abundance from wherever you choose from it. And do not go learning from this group of argumentative deceivers, the Ba'uda. For then you will be among the transgressors. فَأَزَلَّهُمَا الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا And shaitan set both of them, gave both of them, Adam and Iblis, a false sense of stability. You will see why I'm translating it this way. Just be patient. فَأَزَلَّهُمَا الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا فَأَخْرَجَهُمَا مِمَّا كَانَا فِيهِ وَقُلْنَا اهْبِطُوا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوْ وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حين. And shaitan set both of them, meaning gave both of them a false sense of stability. Remember here we're talking about Iblis, Zawj, his counterpart. He gave them this false sense of stability outside of Jannah. I will come back to this translation, set both of them out of Jannah in just one second. Just bear with me. And then he, Allah, brought them out from what they were in from the state of this false sense of stability, meaning he made them aware. Remember we just saw, Allah nudges us sometimes to remember, to recall that we should not be doing this. This is exactly what this ayah is talking about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them out of that state of false confidence, where? Outside of Jannah. And we said, come down toward the Ard. Some of you are enemies to others, and you have in the Ard, the scripture, a domain for seeking insight and a stay for a while. So there's a lot of information in here. Just be patient. We're going to break it down and dissect it one part at a time. But first, I want to start with the verb, azallahuma, this part right here, because it's really crucial that we understand it for the rest of the ayah. Let's do the linguistic analysis of azalla. The verb zalla indicates to slip. Zalla or zalala. It's to slip. So azalla indicates the opposite of slip. How do we know this? Because this letter a, which comes before the verb zalla, sometimes, very common, very often, 
flips the meaning of a verb, changes the meaning to its opposite. We saw this in the discussion of وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةِ in Surah Al-Baqarah when it's talking about the month of Ramadan. We discussed this, go back to that video and you will see the full linguistic analysis of how this letter Alif or Hamza changes the meaning to its opposite. So the original verb is Taqa, Ataqa is the opposite. Qasata, Aqsata is another verb that flips the meaning to its opposite. Most Arabic scholars know this very well, this is very common. The Quran uses it extensively in many, many different cases. This is an example. So azalla does not mean caused them to slip. It means he caused them to feel set, to feel stable, to feel confident. Where? Outside of Jannah. He gave them the false sense of security. He gave them the false confidence that they're doing something right. As we saw a little earlier in some of these ayat that we just translated. So shaitan caused them to feel confidence. He set them. He stabilized them. He steadied them. Where? Out of Jannah. That's where he wants them to stay. Out of Jannah. Remember Jannah is the privileged understanding. The secret concealed understanding that's available to the muttaqoon. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us Jannah. Adam in here represents Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but all of us, Allah subhanahu wa taala gave us Jannah and told us to stay in Jannah, but Shaitan causes us sometimes to feel comfortable out of it, to feel comfortable away from the privileged understanding that we have through the direct communication and direct guidance from Allah. So He gave them both a false sense of stability. So Shaitan now is working not only against the nafs. Shaitan is also working against your rational faculty, even Iblis, your counterpart. Pay attention to this because it's a really interesting dynamic and we're going to see a little more in the diagrams that we're going to show that Shaitan actually is a lot more dangerous, more powerful enemy, more serious foe for us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them out of what they were in, meaning nudged them to remember and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we said, come down toward Al-Ard, come down toward the scripture, the full scripture. You have access to it. Some of you are enemies to others. What do you mean some of you are enemies to others? Remember Ash-Shajara, this, this group of argumentative deceivers, Ba'uda, they're part of the enmity against you. And Shaitan, and Shaitan is an enemy for you. And Iblis, Iblis perhaps is your enemy if you don't rein in Iblis, if you don't control the wild streaks that Iblis can take you toward. So all of those are mentioned in this representative ayah. Some of you are enemies to others. And you have in the Ard, in the scriptural text, a domain for seeking insight and where you can stay for a while. In other words, this scriptural text will stay your primary instrument to find your way to Jannah for a while. For a while, yes, for a while, you heard me. For a while. Is there a time where this instrument would no longer be available? This ayah confirms it. Ilahin, there shall be a time where this instrument will no longer be available to us. So take advantage of it, my friends, my brothers and sisters. Take advantage of what's happening right now. This is no coincidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing to us this knowledge, this ilm at this time. Perhaps the door is going to close soon. Allahu alam. We don't know. I don't talk about eschatology. I don't like that type of talk. But this ayah is very clear. Lakum fil ardi mustaqarrun. A place where you can stay, you seek insight, and a delay for a time, for a limited time. It's not an unlimited time. I hope this ayah is very clear right now, ayah number 36. With that, we continue the story of Adam from Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah 37, 38, and 39. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Who is Adam in here? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we said before. Adam had this situation where he was brought out of Jannah. Yes, he's a human being like everyone else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the situation 
where our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had to undergo this realization, had to understand that without Allah, he can be easily misled by shaitan. Even Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even Muhammad, and he himself talked about this in many different parts of the Quran. And for those of you who believe in the hadith, in very very reliably documented hadith that I believe in because they follow the Abrahamic locution. So our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could easily be part of this discussion. And indeed, Adam in this paragraph refers to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ And then Adam received from his Lord some key expressions, kalimat. What expressions are these? Special dua. What is this dua, Dr. Hani? It is the dua based on the Abrahamic locution. Where? In the insights of the scripture. Remember in here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, you have a domain for seeking insight. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up some keys to our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to understand how to make dua and to teach some of the companions. But more importantly, the Quran is teaching us that through the scripture, you can receive these kalimat. Through the scripture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can open up to you availability of receiving some of these key expressions. And thus, you may be granted a cessation from your earlier mistakes, meaning you are allowed to stop making the older mistakes. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants the cessation from sins. He is the merciful. So what is this talking about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuing the story of why the Quran is revealed. We've talked about this in the prior segments when we discussed Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that in the Quran there are kalimat. Kalimat are the expressions that open up the gates of supplication that allows you to, to communicate with the angels and with Allah. Shukur. This is what the kalimat refer to. فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ He granted him cessation from his earlier mistakes. Here I want to make a little bit more of an additional interpretation. تَابَ عَلَيْهِ That means he allowed the cessation of our mistake through what he brought, what Muhammad wasallam brought to us, which is the Qur'an. So therefore, by following the Qur'an, we can seek the cessation from our earlier mistakes. So now we continue with ayat 38 and 39 from Surah Al-Baqarah. قُلْنَا هَبِطُوا مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا Come down from it, from the state of access to Jannah, all of you. But then if you ever receive direct guidance from me, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا Pay attention to this. This is not about a scripture. This is talking about the direct guidance. Remember, in Nahud Allah, Huda, the guidance from Allah is the guidance. So the guidance is not in the text. The Samawat are not in the text. The guidance is in the Samawat out of the text. And you don't have access to Samawat unless you have direct guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you receive this direct guidance, Hudan, Minni, Min Allah, from Allah. Then whoever follows my guidance, upon them there shall be no fear, nor they shall grieve. And those who reject and belie our signs, those are the companions of the fire. In it they abide khalidun. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ I'm not going to discuss the word khalidun. It takes a whole segment to discuss just this one word. So please allow me to leave it for now. But this ayah is clearly telling us if you reject these concepts that we've just discussed, including the direct guidance from Allah, and you belie the signs. What signs? The ayat that we're reading again and again and again on this channel. All the evidence that we're providing that tells us the direct guidance is the way to go. This is the proper way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to follow. If you reject these things, and belie the signs, you call Allah, astaghfirullah, a liar, then you are among the companions of the fire. Companion of the fire, yes, as we described last time, you are seeking guidance in the darkness, 
using man-made lighting, man-made illumination. Not only this, you are just like Iblis, you become part of the jinn, you seek the man-made illumination through a pinhole, a small tiny little hole. So not only the dim man-made illumination in the middle of the vast darkness of the night is little, but you also receive it through a small tiny pinhole. So those are Ashabu nar as we just described in the last couple of segments. So now we continue with another question. Is Iblis the same as Shaitan? The answer is clearly not because Ayah 236 differentiates between Shaitan on one hand and Adam and his Zawj on the other hand. When we said, فَأَزَلَّهُمَا الشَّيْطَان That means there are three entities. There is a nafs or Adam himself. There is Iblis and there is Shaitan. The three different parts of the equation. So what about Al-Jinnah wal nas This expression that happens a lot in the Quran. Why not Al-Jinnah wal-Bashar? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms shaitan is an enemy specifically to insan. So when we talked about min al jinnati wal nas in Surah 114, Surah An-Nas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say min al jinnati wal bashar because shaitan does not apply to all bashar. Shaitan applies specifically to nas, to insan, those who connect using the scripture who are qualified to receive direct guidance, who are directly guidable. Therefore, it is relating to insan and anas and al-ins. And this is proven as we saw in Surah Yusuf. In another ayah from Surah Az-Zukhruf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us, وَلَا يَصُدَّنَّكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌّ مُّبِينٌ let not shaitan block you, specifically the ones engaging the divine guidance. You're reading right now this ayat. He's talking to us, not talking to all Bashar, talking to people holding the Quran and reading it. Let not the shaitan block you. He is specifically to you a manifest enemy. And if you remember, I talked about advancing this part, which normally in traditional Arabic should be here, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought it forward to stress the exclusivity of this group that he's talking to, meaning us. So shaitan is specifically a manifest enemy for us specifically. I hope this is very, very clear. So now we're going to move into something a little bit more fun, a little bit more illustration type of diagrams that help us elaborate the concept of nafs and how it relates to shaitan, how it relates to iblis, the various parts of nafs, etc., we're developing what's called the Nafs Quranic Psychological Model. And this is presented for the first time on this channel. So please enjoy it. Pay attention to it. There are nine diagrams we're going to go through and explore and elaborate more details with every new diagram we present until we reach the full model. So we start with the very simplest one, the definition of what a nafs is, according to the psychological model in the Quran, starting with the nafs of an infant, of a baby. I have illustrated the nafs of an infant using the largest circle that you see on the screen right here. The nafs of an infant, or the nafs of every human being, as a matter of fact, contains two very obvious parts, and the Quran talks about them. I'm not going to get into that a lot, but I want to bring out the fact that the Quran addresses both parts. We're going to see a little bit more in the future, inshallah, but for now, I'm going to keep it simple. There is the conscious processes and there is the subconscious processes and they do intersect. And you see this little gray area in between to represent the intersection. So what are the conscious processes? So when you're walking, you're thinking about walking, but eventually it becomes part of your subconscious processes. You don't think much about walking after you learn it the very first few times or riding a bicycle or driving a car or playing tennis. After a while, some of the conscious processes become subconscious. So that's one example. What else? Other examples include digestion. You don't think about digestion. Digestion are a bunch of processes that are pretty much subconscious. You don't think about them. 
they're part of your nafs, but they're not conscious. You don't really reflect, I want to digest this molecule or this type of food first or that type of food first. This is all happening automatically, subconsciously, without your feeling it. Okay, what else is included in the conscious processes of an infant? Seeking food and crying to represent the fact that he or she is hungry. That partly is conscious. Recognizing her mom or recognizing his dad, all of these things, even for an infant, they start developing this conscious awareness slowly but surely, and it probably develops further and further around year one or year one and a half, and more and more conscious processes become verbalized or presented or expressed. All right, so that's a very simple beginning. Let's move to the next part. What is the nafs of a learner, a person who learns? So think of this not just as an infant, but a little older, perhaps maybe two years or three years, when they're starting to actively learn a lot. Of course, infants start to learn, but it's mostly subconscious. But at year one and a half, two, three, they start developing a lot more inquisitiveness and they want to learn more and they become like a sponge. They want to learn. So that's the nafs of a learner. A learner has the conscious processes as before. The learner also has the subconscious processes as before. There is an intersection, which is the gray area in here, but they start exhibiting signs of intellect and cognition, meaning learning, meaning questioning, inquisitiveness, prying things, touching things, feeling things. So there are many sorts of inputs from outside world, meaning from other creation, that affects their intellect and their cognition. And in part, they start populating their Weltanschung. It's a very young Weltanschung, but they start populating it. As the person continues to grow, their Weltanschung grows more and more and more and so on. We've talked about this a little bit in the past, but I think all of this is obvious to most of you. The important part is during this phase of learning, we start developing what's called the biases and predilections. What are the biases and the predilections? Biases are things that you reject or refuse without being conscious of why you're doing it. So think of an adult person who grabs the salt every time they're offered a new plate of food and they instantly shake some salt over it even before tasting it. That's a predilection. They want to have salty food or they reject certain color of food or they walk in a certain way or they think badly of a certain person many, many different biases that we all have as learners. That starts very early on. It starts from the learnings that this child acquires in his home, in his environment, in his context. And that's why social training starts very early and we have to be really careful with how we train our children. All right, so biases and predilections start developing as a young person and they continue with us for the rest of our lives. So this is a segment that is partly subconscious and partly conscious if we choose to make it conscious. But it's also an important part of our intellect and cognition. Please pay attention to this. This is extremely essential. So they affect our ability to learn because they bias us against certain things and they cause us to favor certain sources. So when, when a Muslim refuses to listen to someone like me who doesn't wear the right turban or doesn't have the length of beard, that's a bias or a predilection. They prefer a certain kind of look. That's how they think a scholar should look. And therefore, it is part of the biases and predilection. We all have these things. I remember as a young kid, I had a friend who loved Bruce Lee in these Bruce Lee movies. And Bruce Lee has a certain gait, a certain way of walking. So he started walking like him as a kid. You know, we were eight years old, 12 years old, somewhere in that range. And I saw him many years later and he still walks in the same way. He still has that predilection. It became ingrained in him. It became part of his subconsciousness. 
So he doesn't even recognize he's still doing this. But I remember when he started walking this on purpose. It became part of his subconscious predilection. All right. I hope this is clear. This is just a few examples that I'm trying to introduce the concept of biases and predilection. What else? Group think. The safety of belonging with a group that think alike. We talked about this. Group think is a bias. Or it's a predilection, however way you want to decide. So there are many, many such examples. A little earlier, we saw the confirmation bias, meaning something you seek based on presupposition. You're not aware that you're already predecided before starting to read a part of the Quran as to what the story means. And therefore, when you read the story, immediately you start picking the things that confirm your existing presupposition. That's called confirmation bias. So that's a type of bias and so on. So that's the nafs of a learner. Now we move into a little bit more sophistication. What does the nafs of a bashar look like? This is a learner, but not necessarily an insan. Remember, insan is the one who attaches himself to a scripture. He's directly guidable. He's a directly guidable human being. Now we're talking about a regular bashar, not insan. A regular Bashar, not insan, we remember, has these biases and predilections. And the title for those things is Iblis. So that's why we say Iblis is part of Bashar. Iblis can be possibly part of every Bashar. Including insan? Yes, including insan. But here we're talking only about Bashar, just to illustrate the concept. So now we have the concept of Iblis that fits right here in this intersection that we just described from before. With the conscious processes, we make decisions, we provide opinions, we express opinions, and we learn from the outside world, from creation. So therefore, all of these arrows make sense, I hope. Now, what about these two arrows in here? Using the intellect and cognition, and the thinking processes, and the learning approaches, and the various activities that we take to learn and to inquire, and so on we create additional aspects and factors in our Weltanschauung. And based on that Weltanschauung, primarily subconsciously, it leads us to think and reflect in certain ways. So therefore, this Iblis part happens partly subconsciously, but there is even more coming from the Weltanschauung into the, intell the intellect and the cognition. If you remember, I gave the example of a person whose primary Weltanschung is built on the understanding that success equal money. Success equal money is the foundation of his Weltanschung. So therefore, anytime he is doing something, the first question he's going to ask is, how is this going to help me make more money? Because that's how his Weltanschung is built. So this is this arrow right here. Sometimes he's aware of it. Sometimes he's not aware of it. It comes through unconscious contribution that his subconscious processes make with the help of Iblis, etc. So I hope this diagram makes sense. We will continue, inshallah, with the next diagram to illustrate it a little bit more. So now with this diagram, we're talking about the nafs of what we call a disciplined Bashar. What is a disciplined Bashar? Again, this is a Bashar who is not necessarily an insan, who doesn't have direct connection to a scripture, but possibly have advanced thinking, intellectual capabilities to help him neutralize part of Iblis that he has. Remember, Iblis is part of every Bashar, including the disciplined Bashar. So do they have the ability to control Iblis? Yes, they do. Not just the people of the scripture do. And you remember we said Iblis is useful, but also applicable in a damaging way to our intellectual processes and cognition. So therefore, when we think, when we learn, Iblis can influence this in a negative way or can help us if we try to keep Iblis under control. So a disciplined Bashar has Iblis under control to a certain degree. So this disciplined Bashar questions the opinions and the decisions he makes. He doesn't immediately think they're correct just because they came out from him or from her. They also question the sources of learning. 
They ask a lot of questions before accepting anything as true or as correct. This is the discipline that we're talking about. So what about these two arrows, greed arrows in here? We're introducing them now for the first time in this diagram. There is Ma, which is the divine revelation, and there is Nasr, which is Arsh or Arsh repair specifically. We've talked about Nasr or abrogation as we defined it on this channel. Refer back to the video titled Nasr and abrogation in the Quran. So these two green arrows happen for a Bashar who is not attached to a scripture, meaning who does not seek guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I said before, we cannot reject this. We cannot exclude this from the possibility of what Allah may do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give a nudge or certain guidance to some person who is not even connected to the Quran or to any scripture. Why? For reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Perhaps it is good for other human beings. Perhaps it's a way to compensate him in this life for things that he has done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. So we cannot exclude this from the possibility of happening. So that's why we cannot say that a person who is not insan, just bashar, does not receive divine revelation. We cannot say this. Many, many non-Muslims, even atheists, come up with brilliant ideas that help mankind. Where did they get these ideas from? Of course, from Allah. All knowledge comes from Allah. Why? We don't know. How will Allah judge these people? We don't know. But the fact that they did receive certain revelations in the form of aha moment or brilliant ideas is undeniable. And therefore, we cannot reject the possibility that these green arrows exist even for a person who is not associated with a scripture. All right, so I hope this is clear. We move on to the next diagram, which gets us a little bit more into the area of a jinn. What does the nafs of a jinn look like? Ah, there's a lot of red here. Be careful because there's a lot of hot, hot fire-like kind of symbolism that I'm using in the coloring scheme. So as before, he has subconscious processes, he has conscious processes, but his Weltanschung and his Iblis are very, very powerful. Remember, a jinn is someone who falls prey and succumbs to the strategies of Iblis. And therefore, when we talk about jinn, we're talking about a person who is fully dominated by Iblis. He becomes jinn, meaning he becomes of the same concealed nature of Iblis. And therefore, Iblis not only controls his intellect and cognition, the intellect and cognition affect all of his conscious processes. They affect his Weltanschung. His Weltanschung starts becoming corrupt like the Iblis. And the Weltanschung feeds back into the intellect and cognition that this person has. So therefore, he becomes really embodying Iblis in everything almost. Only some of his subconscious processes remain free from Iblis. His digestion or some of the biological functions that he's not aware of remain free from the effect of Iblis. Pretty much everything else in his nafs is affected by Iblis, as we said, and that person becomes a jinn. The opinions and the decisions he issues are directly influenced by his conscious processes, which are affected by his influence by Iblis. And everything he seeks to learn, because he's influenced by the biases that are given to him by Iblis, everything he learns or seeks to learn has to match his confirmation biases or his prejudices or his prior predilections, as we saw. So this is a person who is jinn, who's fully taken over by Iblis, as we described in the prior segments. Very well. So what comes next? Now we go to a little bit more complicated diagram. The nafs of insan, meaning a learner plus a scripture. So this is a bashar who is a learner who is developing. Plus he has connection or she has connection to a scripture. So what do we have? We have the green arrows, which represent the connection to receive divine revelation from Allah. Ma, and to receive the nasr because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls how our Weltanschung is repaired 
as before, they have conscious processes, they have subconscious processes, they have the gray zone right here, which is the intersection. They also have a belief, they also have an intellect and a cognition, and they learn from outside and they issue opinions and decisions. So what else is new? They have a qalb. How do we know this? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, and we discussed this before, man kana lahu qalb, al-insan lahu qalb. So for the first time, now we see the concept of qalb appearing on this diagram. So qalb is the repository or the receptor of the divine guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it is where the Weltanschung resides. Therefore, insan who has access to scripture, who works on it, not necessarily perfectly, has a qalb and has some Weltanschung already starting to move in the green direction, in the direction of al-ma that's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that mean he's perfect? No, he's not. Because his intellect and cognition often deposit some wrong things into the qalb, which turns the qalb from green to lighter yellow or perhaps bright yellow. And some of the things coming from the qalb back to the intellect are affected by this mixed bag he has in this qalb, the Weltanschung that is not fully pure, that's not fully correct, is very, very defective. So this is a normal insan, a learner who has access to a scripture and who's working toward it, but not necessarily perfect. So this is the average most of the people who attach themselves to a scripture can fit this diagram. This is the nafs of insan, learner plus scripture. Next, we go to the next diagram, which is a little bit more green as we see. This is the nafs of muttaqun. Remember, muttaqun are a special class of people, especially of insan, who are disciplined in their engagement of the scripture, specifically the Quran. So we're talking about muttaqun who are Muslim, who are attached to the Quran, who take it seriously, who engage the Quran in the proper way every time they engage it. They try, they don't always succeed 100%, but they are working very seriously and diligently with patience, etc., etc. So they have some of the characteristics of the disciplined bashar, and they have some of the characteristics of the insan that we just saw. So their qalb is a lot more green, not necessarily perfect. There are some yellow areas down here, as you see. Some of these yellow areas seep into their intellect and cognition. Iblis, for them, is a lot more under control. They're aware of their biases. They're aware of their predilections. They rein in Iblis. They're, they don't allow Iblis to control them. So as much as possible, they ask questions of themselves before issuing opinions and decisions. And before they learn from outside sources, they inquire, they are very serious, they don't accept just everything, they're not part of the herd, they think, they reflect, they take it very seriously, they work on themselves, and therefore their qalb is a lot cleaner, a lot greener, and therefore the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is open, they have access to jannat, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps them by repairing their arsh, so now we have a qalb that contains a Weltanschung, but it's starting to lean toward the Arsh. Remember, Arsh is closer to perfection. It's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes his full dominion. Full Arsh is the Arsh of Al-Abrar. We're going to see this next. But for the Muttaqun, it's very close, but it's still a Weltanschung. It's not perfect. As far as Al-Abrar, we have a lot better picture. The qalb is full of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that comes from the qalb into their intellect and cognition is guided by the divine guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's in their qalb. Their intellect and cognition does not pollute al qalb or the arsh of Allah. The divine revelation reinforces the arsh of Allah. The nasq happen regularly, so if there is any mistakes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps them clean it up. And we saw this when we discussed Nasq for Rusul and Anbiya, if you remember. And their conscious processes ooze with all sorts of beautiful things. 
So these are al-abrar, the highest class of people who allow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have full control over their arsh. And they have very special relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their Iblis, remember, is fully under control. They don't make mistakes that allow their cognitive biases and predilections to derail them from the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we saw the full set of people as they relate to Iblis. Now we introduce Shaitan. Where does Shaitan live in all of this? Shaitan lives in the subconscious fully. Shaitan acts as a shield to cover the Weltanschung and the Kalb. So I hope you see that in here, the Kalb was fully available to receive the divine revelation. Now with Shaitan, Shaitan blocks the divine revelation blocks the naskh, blocks also part of the dhikra that comes out from here into the cognition. So shaitan is acting to restrict all of these green arrows that come into the qalb. And therefore your intellect and your cognition don't have the benefit of full access to the arsh as with al-abrar and al-muttaqun. So this is the nafs of insan with shaitan as you see in here. Notice that this red egg shape in here actually covers up the heart. So that's why we read earlier, وَجَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّا We covered their hearts with blankets like covers that prevent them from receiving the guidance and from hearing the guidance. And therefore, they don't receive the naskh the repair of the Weltanschung. And therefore, this becomes a closed system where they mislead themselves and they think some more to cause their Weltanschung to be more defective, which also causes their thinking to go wrong and so on and so forth. And they think they are rightly guided. They don't question their own opinions because their Iblis is very active and they are willing to receive without questioning. So this is what shaitan helps to do. It prevents us from having access to the source of truth from Allah and it empowers Iblis. Why? Because Iblis can only be defeated if we have a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with this, we move to the worst part, the worst type of human being, a nafs of jinn with a shaitan. So we talked about jinn separately. We talked about shaitan separately. Now we talk about a person who is described in the Quran as shayateen al insi wal jinn. So there is shayateen of ins and there is shayateen of jinn. So we're talking about shaitan of jinn. So he's suffering from the effect of iblis and he's suffering also from the effect of shaitan. And as you see on this diagram, it's pretty red all over the place. And nafs, which is the largest circle in here, has conscious processes that are pretty stained with the effect of shaitan. Shaitan has spilled over into the area of Iblis and the full intellectual aspects of this person. Everything that comes out from the intellectual cognition is red. Everything that goes back into the intellect and cognition is red. There is no connection with the divine. There is no nasikh happening. This person moves from worse worse and they cause damage to a lot of people who are around them while some of them think they are rightly guided. So this is a very serious diagram. I hope this brings the picture home as to what is Iblis and what is Shaitan and what is the difference between the two. So now I hope you've noticed that with the Shaitan present when this red egg like thing comes in here into the picture these green arrows are blocked they're stopped we stop receiving the divine guidance and our situation gets worse and worse. So there is great antagonism between Shaitan and Ar-Rahman, who is the source of the divine guidance that we receive. I'm not going to talk about Ar-Rahman a lot in this segment, just to keep this segment from being excessively long. But inshallah, in future segments, we will talk a lot more about Ar-Rahman. I want to focus a little bit about Surah Maryam where Ibrahim alayhi salam is talking to his father and he says, Ya abati la ta'abudi shaytan, inna shaytana kana lirrahmani asiyya. 
يا أبت إني أخاف أن يمسك عذاب من الرحمن فتكون للشيطان وليا Oh my father, do not worship shaitan Shaitan is specifically for ar-Rahman disobedient So we have a direct connection again We're reading in accordance with the reversal of this order The traditional way of saying this sentence كان عصيا للرحمن So ar-Rahman should come after عصيا But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put للرحمن before عصيا to bring exclusivity or special focus to Ar-Rahman. So shaitan is specifically for Ar-Rahman disobedient. As we will see in future segments, Ar-Rahman is the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that relates to communicating with him, that relates to our ability to receive Rahma in the sense of direct guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will see a lot more about this insha'Allah. Ibrahim continues, يَا أَبَتِ إِنِّي أَخَافُ أَنْ يَمَسَّكَ عَذَابٌ مِنَ الرَّحْمَانِ فَتَكُونَ لِلشَّيْطَانِ وَلِيًّا Oh my father, I'm afraid that you would be affected by a punishment from Ar-Rahman and thus you become an ally of shaitan. Now please pay attention. All of those who translate Ar-Rahman as it's related to mercy in the sense of forgiveness have never read this ayah, it seems, because clearly Ar-Rahman delivers punishment, as Ibrahim is telling his father in this ayah. So Ar-Rahman is not just about mercifulness and wishful thinking of a free ticket to Jannah or Paradise. It's very clear in here. Please pay attention, because Ar-Rahman punishes us by depriving us of the direct guidance. And this is what Ibrahim السلام, is telling his father. This is reinforced in another surah, Surah Az Zukhruf, ayah number 36, 37, and 38. Whoever hears on the Rahmani, he is a person who is a person who is a person who is a person who is a so whoever refuses to see the importance of dhikr of Rahman against him specifically, we shall establish a shell, a shaitan, and he becomes adjoined, adjoined to him. Why did I say a shell? This word, nuqayyid, which is from the gerund qayd, with the dad, literally means eggshell or an encasement that is hard to penetrate and it represents a metaphorical image of what shaitan does to the qalb as we have just seen. So shaitan is literally this eggshell like cover that prevents any divine guidance from coming in. And we have to be really careful about this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us if you neglect to see the importance of dhikr in the Quran, dhikr rahman especially the stories and the parables that we've been focused on throughout this whole series, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will set a hard shell around the core of such people. This hard shell is shaitan. نُقَيِّدْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا So the shaitan is that shell that we're talking about. And this shell becomes attached to him to the point where it's like a joined as we will see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing shaitan as qareen in this case. So this is the definition of the qareen. The qareen is the hard shell over the core, over the qalb that becomes so attached, you cannot get rid of it. This state is reversible with certain conditions, but it is very hard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this shaitan as qareen, very much adjoined. By the way, the word qareen, right here in green, comes from the gerund qarn or qarana, which means to adjoin. And it literally comes when they attach two animals together, they yoke them, they become qarin, they cannot separate from each other. This is the word qarana or qarin. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing this shaitan as becoming adjoined to the person who neglects to see the importance of dhikr. And we've talked a little bit about this in the past, but there's something even more important. The word Ya'shu 
is from Ashawa, which means to have an evening. If this interpretation holds, that means if you spend the evenings without remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you make it a habit of evening after evening after evening after evening, and you're not remembering dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the stories and the parables from the Quran, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will start setting this shell over the core. And over time, it becomes a qareen, a joined, inseparable from your nafs. I say this to bring to your attention something really critical, because the next ayah defines it even more. وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَصُدُّونَهُمْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ Now the tone shifted to plural. This ayah right here, 36, is talking about single. Single person with single shaitan. Or you can read it as shaitan is the genus, meaning the genre, the collection of type of shaitan. This ayah turns to a plural tone. And they, and they, the many shaitan, block them from the way while they think they are seeking guidance. It's a disastrous situation. Those people who don't know they are adjoined to shaitan, who have fulfilled all the conditions of shaitan as we just saw, think they are seeking guidance, and yet they are blocking them from divine guidance. We continue with the last ayah. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَنَا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَنَا قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكَ بُعْدَ الْمَشْرِقَيْنِ until after a while when he comes to us, comes to Allah, he says to his adjoined other, Oh, how I wish there was between me and you a distance like that between the two locations of the two sunrises. We've talked about the sunrises or the location of the sunrises, if you remember when we talked about Dhul Qarnayn. So here he's referring to, do, to two different messengers. Al-Mashriqain. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a hint that this is relating to more than one scripture. So if it happens to Bani Israel before us, it could happen to us too. Don't dismiss the seriousness of this ayat. Don't think because we are Muslims, we cannot be misled and adjoined to shaitan as this is describing in this ayat. And now we continue with the translation and interpretation of this paragraph I promised you from Surah Qaf. Surah Qaf includes this paragraph about the relationship between Insan and the Qareen and other characters that we're going to read and interpret and discuss. But before we start, I want to warn you that there are some really advanced concepts in here that we're not going to be able to illustrate or to demonstrate or to even explain in a lot of details. I include hints about them to those of you who are more advanced in their engagement of the Quran and they appreciate the concepts that we're talking about. Please do not write about these concepts in the comment stream. Please do not discuss these things in a public manner because some of these concepts I'm not ready to share with everyone else. I just give them to you as a gift for those of you who have persisted with me throughout this whole segment and stayed with this segment all the way to the end. So I hope you appreciate this gift. And if you need to discuss it, please use the email, which is included in the description box, to communicate with me directly. So we start, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ and we have created insan, the directly guidable man, and we know whatever his nafs secretly insinuates to him. Remember, we talked about to wiswis, and this is a verb of shaitan. So this is clearly talking about a part of insan that is the shaitan as we have discussed. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ And we are closer to him than his jugular vein, the vein that actually connects the heart through the neck all the way to the brain. Such as when the two receivers receive, remember whenever we have this pattern of two words of the same gerund following each other back to back, there is something that the Quran is drawing our attention to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, wake up, there is something that I need you to hear. 
to receive, to understand, because words like this of the same gerund usually don't come back to back. But in the Quran, this is a signal, this is a pattern. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, pay attention, I'm saying something interesting in here, something unusual, something perhaps that the average reader may not pick up on. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in here is that these two receivers, which are traditionally reported to us as these two angels sitting one of them on our left shoulder, one of them on our right shoulder, and we're writing everything, and we've discussed this before, and we have clearly rejected this concept on basis that we've explained in prior videos. This concept in here is something different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that you have two receivers. These receivers are not necessarily receiving to write down your deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need a secretary to track your deeds on his behalf for him to remember. So this is something different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us you have two characters with you receiving live in real time everything that we're going to see you do and you say. So anytime we see this pattern, we have to stop and reflect and ask ourselves, what is the Quran trying to tell us? Why is it using this pattern? When the two receivers receive, and I added in here of deception, and you will see why. One of them, Iblis, from beyond righteousness and from beyond the wickedness on the left hand, taking a position vigilantly against the insan on his path to follow the methodology for self-correction. As we saw in Surah Al-A'raf number 16, لَهُمْ صِرَاتَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ The exact same word. This is a marking. So now we relate one parable to another parable. So this is a parable. It's part of the dhikr of the Quran. And that one in Surah Al-A'raf is also a parable from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us about Iblis and his strategy in that ayah. So there we learn about the right hand or beyond the right hand specifically and beyond the left hand as is exactly in this ayah. عَنِ الْيَمِينَ وَعَنِ الشِّمَالِ So immediately through the marking we get a clear indication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Iblis. So therefore he's not talking about the two angels that the tradition has talked about. So therefore, we continue. مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ Not a saying does he, the insan, utter. But listening to him is a second, second observer, shaheed, as we will see in a few seconds. This observer is shaitan, consenting justifier. Raqib, consenting. Atid is a justifier. These descriptions are fairly advanced for the average Quran reader, but if you go, for example, to Ayah 2094, where Harun is discussing his own failure after Musa returns from receiving the Torah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Harun says to Musa, وَلَمْ تَرْقُبْ قَوْلِي وَلَمْ تَرْقُبْ قَوْلِي Exactly the same word. So Raqib is not just an observer. Raqib is a consenter, meaning someone who obeys, someone who follows the commands. So therefore, Raqib is someone who follows the commands. Here we have one of these two characters that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is discussing in this ayat. One of them is consenting, is obeying, is following what we is following what we choose for him to do. What else does he do? A justifier. Atid. We will see this when we discuss the story of Yusuf. She prepared for them a legal justification for what they were about to do. The verb a'tada in the Quran consistently refers to this concept where there is some justification being prepared. It is not just a'adda. For my Arabic speaking brothers, please pay attention. A'adda is something different to prepare. A'tada or atid or a'tadat refers to preparing a justification, usually of a legal kind or some logical justification. Here we clearly have a character within a nafs, 
within a nafs, sitting with a nafs, and preparing justifications. So we say this is shaitan, and you're going to see why. There's more description coming throughout the rest of these ayat that are going to give us a clear indication based on the nafs psychological model that I just shared with you a little earlier. You're going to see how shaitan is actually sitting there observing, watching us, and receiving instructions, raqib, and providing justification. So all of these functions are part of shaitan's character or shaitan's responsibility or role. Now we continue. وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْهُ تَحِيدٍ And when death days, meaning the days right before death, and the days right before deep sleep. This is a new concept. I've never shared this with you before. Please keep it to yourself. This is a very important concept throughout the whole Quran, and we're going to see it more and more as we proceed. The concept here is that period of stupor, that period of almost unconsciousness right before sleep. You're not yet sleep fully and you're yet not awake anymore. This day's period is discussed in the Quran in many, many different places. And this is a very important concept that we're going to discuss more and more, as I said, in future segments. So, وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ This is not death itself. It's the days before death or the days before sleep that feels exactly like the days before death. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sharing with us something critical in here. Bilhaq, bringing the truth. This is again part of this concept that I'm not going to discuss in public with many, many people. Keep it to yourself. Don't write about it in the comment stream, please. And this is now discussing with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa directly. This is what has allowed you, Muhammad, to diverge from the superficial zina. ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْهُ تحيد. So tahid, the verb tahid, is to diverge. Diverge from what? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did not diverge from anything except by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Much later, when we discuss Millata Ibrahim Hanifan, Hanifan means to diverge. It's the same concept. There are a couple of other words in the Quran used for the exact same concept. We will discuss them inshallah in the future. For now, all I need to say is that the Quran is addressing Prophet Muhammad وسلم, teaching him that this days before deep sleep is the period when you would receive the direct guidance. This is discussing it with Muhammad وسلم. This is what has allowed you, Muhammad, to diverge from what? From the superficial Zina, from the superficial layer of the Quran that we discussed. So the process is as follow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the direct guidance to allow you to see beyond what's written on the superficial level of the scriptural text. If you are patient, if you're engaging the Quran, if you ask questions, if you trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have the certainty in the truthfulness of the Quran, that period of time right before sleep, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flash download all the answers into your qalb. And from there on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will release this information through zikra. This is a complete process. Please do not discuss these concepts in the comment stream. So we continue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what has allowed you, Muhammad, to avoid being stuck at the superficial level of zina of the scripture. We continue. وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ ذَلِكَ يَوْمُ الْوَعِيدِ And the curved instrument is blown. That is the time of the assured promise. Blown where? فِي الصُّورِ The curved instrument. Sur in Arabic, in the original Arabic, literally means a curved instrument. Some people from Bani Israel use that exact same word to describe the horn, the blow horn that they use, the ram's horn that they carve out and they blow through etc etc but that's not the original word the original meaning of the term is any curved instrument in this case it's the ear again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the same concept the hearing so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quote unquote yam fukh blows in the ear fissur in this curved instrument 
the divine guidance that we've been talking about all through this channel. So this divine guidance is received metaphorically by a blow, a whisper, a sort of a slight puff of air in the ear when during these days right before sleep. And now you know a secret that very, very, very few people know that the Quran discusses all the way through its discussions on these topics. وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَعَهَا سَائِقٌ وَشَهِيدٌ And there, every nafs comes. Comes to where? Comes to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he discussed when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us Allah يَتَوَفَّ الْأَنفُسَ حِينَ مَوْتِهَا وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُتْ فِي مَنَامِهَا Allah receives the nafs or the anfus at the time of its death and the ones that did not die at the time of their sleep. This is what it's talking about. It's talking about Sakratul Maut, the days right before deep sleep. Therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ Allah is receiving, is retrieving this nafs. Why? To give it its due account and its due guidance. Therefore, when we see, وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ you're receiving the divine message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this exact moment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing that this nafs comes with two characters. One of them is sa'iq, a driver, and the other one is a witness, shaheed. <clears throat> so the second one, the dutiful witness, is a very interesting character that we're going to hear more about. And this is referred to as the Qareen. So who is Sa'iq? Sa'iq is your intellect. It's the one that helps you make your decisions. If your intellect is stained with Iblis, then your intellect is defective. If your intellect is in control over Iblis, then you're not a jinn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not discuss this part any further during the rest of this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses it in the next paragraph, which we're going to see. So we're going to focus from here on, on the shaheed, which is referred to as Qareen, your adjoint character, your adjoint one, your yoked buddy. Now, I want you to notice that when we say one of them is adjoined to the other, that means necessarily the next one is adjoined to the first one too. So they're adjoined to each other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to exploit in this concept and one time refers to Qareen as you and one time refers to Qareen as the witness, which is shaitan. And we are going to see this in detail, inshallah. You have to stay awake. You have to stay alert to really understand the depth of this paragraph. The next ayah, ayah 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, you Muhammad have been unaware of this. But then we have cleared the way your concealing shroud. Remember we talked about غِطَاء or تَغَشَّاهَا غِشَاوَة or akinna. All of these concepts that covers that cover the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our beloved, that now we have revealed your shroud. We have uncovered what was blocking you from receiving such information. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly telling him, you, لَقَدْ كُنْتَ Muhammad, فِي غَفْلَةٍ مِنْ هَذَا You have been unaware of this. And then we have cleared away your concealing shroud, the shroud that concealed this information from you. And thus, your vision today is in accordance with the divine linguistic boundaries, hadid, as we discussed it before. So now the concepts make a lot of sense. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is communicating with us using hadid, basaruka, your ability to see. This is a reference to understanding the scripture. Remember, the vision or the eyesight or basar is a reference to understanding the scripture. Hearing is a reference to receiving the direct divine guidance through nafakha fi sur or nafakha min ruhihi. All of these concepts are all related and part of the same semantic descriptions that the Quran uses in the Abrahamic locution. I hope this makes sense. This is really, really interesting stuff. And this is unique in the sense that no other channel is talking to you about this. I hope you take it to heart and you keep it and you reflect on it 
and you don't discuss it in public, please, this is very confidential for those of you who have stuck with me all the way through this segment. So you, Muhammad, have been unaware of this until this revelation, but then we have cleared away your concealing shroud, and thus your vision today is in accordance with the divine linguistic boundaries. This ayah is an intercepting ayah. What do I mean by that? This ayah right here intercepts the prior story, the prior parable that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about each nafs coming with a driver and a dutiful witness. So this specific ayah is addressing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as a parenthetical. It says, by the way, this is what has caused you to avoid understanding the scripture based on the superficial layer of the scripture. Tahid, you're sort of deviating from the obvious, not following the basic obvious interpretation, but diving into the less obvious words and the tafsil and the hadid, all of these things are part of tahid. You're, you're sort of moving away from the beaten path. So now we return to the main story discussed in this paragraph. وَقَالَ قَرِينُهُ هَذَا مَا لَدَيَّ عَتِيدٌ And the one who is adjoined to the dutiful witness, meaning the insan himself, remember I told you, there are two that are adjoined. The insan, the nafs, and the witness, meaning shaitan. Both of them are adjoined to each other. So now the Quran is going to play on this and one time uses Qareen to refer to one of them, second time uses Qareen to refer to the other part of this pair. We're not talking about Iblis here, we're talking about Shaitan. So the Shaitan and Nafs are Qareen, Iblis and Nafs are what? Counterparts, beautiful. So this is the terminology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to distinguish between these two types of pairing that are included within the nafs as we saw in the model that we just shared with you in the illustrations before. وَقَالَ قَرِينُهُ And the one who is adjoined to the dutiful witness, meaning al-insan himself, the nafs. Remember, وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ Every nafs comes with it too. This is one of them, qareen. And the qareen here that's speaking in this ayah is the insan himself. And he says, I have this one, meaning the dutiful witness, as the consenting justifier with me. Atid, remember Atid, I described it. Atid describes the person who offers justifications, who puts up excuses, who laments, who blames others. And therefore, here Insan or the nafs of Insan is saying, blame him, blame Shaitan, O oh Allah. I have come to you with a shaitan, with this witness. Blame him because he has been the one who has provided the justifications for me. So this is common. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us. That if you think you can blame shaitan for your actions, now you're going to see exactly what will happen to this nafs. Allah says, Throw in Jahannam every stubborn rejecter. So no, you don't get to blame shaitan. You are the one who is making the decisions and shaitan is ultimately under your control. Shaitan is part of your nafs, but you cannot blame shaitan for everything that you do. You cannot say he's a justifier and refuse to take responsibility on your own. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al both of you, both of you throw in Jahannam every stubborn rejecter. So who are the two here? The first one is Shaitan, the second one is Iblis. Both of them lead to Jahannam. Remember we talked about a partnership between the two foes. Against whom? Against us, against our nafs. So Iblis on one hand and Shaitan on the other hand are represented by a driver, Iblis, and the witness, Shaheed, and both of them lead you to Jahannam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that their function is to cast the nafs into Jahannam. So who is being cast into Jahannam? The people who are stubborn rejectors, kafar, repeatedly rejecting, anid, stubborn, manna'in lil khair, refusing or preventing the reception of the good application about the scripture, good understanding of the scripture.
Suspicious obtruder, they interrupt your reception of guidance. They cause doubts. They don't want you to trust Allah. They don't want you to have this relationship of certainty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't want you to feel the tranquility in your heart. This murib, this cause of suspicions and doubts. الذي جعل مع الله إلها آخر who has taken with Allah another deity and then القياه في العذاب الشديد and then throw him into the severe punishment so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now has talked about Jahannam and talked about severe punishment both and they're different they're not the same don't assume they're the same thing otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have put two separate ayat as we see in here we will talk more about Jahannam in the future and about this Adab Shadid, the severe punishment. Remember the scene is during the death days, meaning the days right before death and the days right before deep sleep, where a nafs is coming to receive from Allah. Receive what? Either rewards or further distraction, further misdirection, further confusion as promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran for those who reject and those who belie. So depending on what you bring to that period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us what's going to happen. So for those who are stubborn, kafar anid, stubborn rejectors, they get thrown into Jahannam. For those who associate with Allah another source of guidance, another ilah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will throw them in the deep, severe punishment. قَالَ قَرِينُهُ رَبَّنَا مَا أَطْغَيْتُهُ Now his adjoined other says, who is this one now? This is the witness, this is shaitan. This is shaitan rejecting what the nafs had claimed. Remember in here, the nafs had claimed that I have the shaitan to blame. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejected this. And now shaitan himself is saying, no, 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 it was not me. And this is confirmed in many other ayat, including... Ayah 59, 16, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that when shaitan invites insan to reject and that insan chooses to reject, then shaitan backs away and says, I have nothing to do with what you have just done. This is exactly the same scene as Ayah 59, 16. So I was not the one who forced him to commit excesses, but he was on his own in far aberration. قَالَ قَرِينُهُ رَبَّنَا مَا أَطْغَيْتُهُ I was not the one who did this. وَلَكِنْ كَانَ فِي ضَلَالٍ بَعِيدٍ He has been far gone in his aberration. In other words, he was just seeking justification for me. I did not cause him to go seeking that rejection and that denying that he did. I hope this is really clear. And this is a shocking understanding of these ayat. This is giving us a deep metaphorical representation of all that goes on between the different parts of our nafs, as we just described. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you are not to quarrel regarding what you heard from me. And I have proffered you, given you in advance the warnings and the news and the information. I have proffered you the assured promise, al-wa'id. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ending that argument by sharing with us that his final conclusion is that you don't get to quarrel matters in front of me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear that at this day's period, this time of stupor, you don't get to argue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the final conclusion, the reward immediately, instantly during your life. We're not talking about after death. We're talking about the days before death and the days before deep sleep. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly telling us, you don't get to argue, you are going to be given your account based on what you've done. But he's sharing with us what the insan will say, the one who is adjoined to the witness, and what the witness will reply, meaning what shaitan will refuse to take responsibility for the actions of an nafs. It's very clear, it's very obvious. This is the end of that parable. This is the end of that scene. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to shift and tell us about something different, something that no one has paid attention to. This is clearly going to stun a lot of people. 
but please pay attention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is starting a new scene. A new scene for whom? Not for the ones who rejected. What happens to the good people who are during that days receiving the good things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about such people. So here we have a new scene. Pay attention. ما يبدل القول لدي وما أنا بظلام للعبيد يوم نقول لجهنم هل امتلأت. These are two sentences that are split for zina purposes, for zubur purposes. So I need you to pay attention. The word يوم is an adverb. It describes a time period. A time period for what? A time period for what's coming and described in this ayah, but it really starts in this ayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, on the day we shall say to Jahannam, are you filled? And Jahannam answers, hal min mazid. And I will tell you what that means in one second. On that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the people to whom this discussion applies are the people who do not change al-qawl, who do not change the locution that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used. So let me read the interpretation and then we'll come back to the Arabic and then you understand exactly the depth of this significant parable that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sharing with us in these two ayat. So let's read the translation and then I'll come back to the Arabic and deals with it in more detail. Words heard from me may not be substituted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us those who did not substitute the words I taught them, the locution, the, 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 divine, the divine lexicon, they have preserved it, they have understood it, they have taken a dive into the insights below the superficial layer to extract this terminology. All of these concepts are included in here. ما يبدل القول لدي The one heard from me. Nor am I a transgressor against those who selected to be slaves to others. So therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is distinguishing between two groups. The first group we just finished discussing, those who chose to be slave to others. And they cannot blame shaitan nor iblis for that. The second one, the second group, are the people who do not change al-qawl, the words or the discourse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. In other words, the Quran, the scripture, those words, these expressions cannot be changed. When we use them, we have to use them as they are intended in the Quran. We cannot make up our own supplication. We cannot make up our own prayers. We cannot make up our own expressions to describe how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to worship Him, to communicate with Him, to do shukur with Him. ما يبدل القول لدي. You cannot change the words and the expressions. You cannot substitute them. Nor am I a transgressor against those who selected to be slaves on their own selected to be slaves to others. Okay, so what about the people who do not change the words, do not change the expressions, the divine lexicon? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on that day, the time of the days that we just described, for those people, we will say to Jahannam, are you filled yet? And Jahannam says, Hal min mazid? Is there any more? Now, this is one of those things where a question really does not mean a question. If you trace all of the expressions in the Quran that start with Hal min, Hal min, this specific marking, this specific indication, you find that the answer is no, no more. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, Jahannam will say, no more. I'm not going to accept. I'm not going to accept who? The people who do not change al-qawl, who do not substitute the words heard from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for those people, there is no Jahannam. That's what these ayat are saying. It's representing it in the exact opposite of what they taught us in the traditional books of tafsir. This is really good news for people who refuse to substitute the words of Allah, the expressions of Allah, the divine lexicon. I hope this has left an impact on you because this to me is very touching and very revealing of the depth of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us. In just about 15 or 16 ayah of Surah Qaf, as we saw, there are so much information and details and concepts. Inshallah, we will explore them further in future segments. 
So we continue inshallah with this segment and we come to a liberating conclusion that I hope you teach to all of those around you. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us through all of these challenges of dealing with Iblis and dealing with Shaitan and them cooperating and collaborating against us and messing us up without our perception necessarily, without us paying attention to exactly how they operate. Well, the truth is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained all of this in the Quran. Some of the people who have taken it upon themselves to explain the Quran have neglected or failed to explain to Muslims the seriousness of all of these issues. It is not the fault of the Quran. It's not the fault of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, astaghfirullah. It's the fault of people who did not convey to us all of these concepts and train us since we were children to understand these issues. Now, faith is empty without dealing with resistance that challenges that faith. So to say I have faith and not to subject it to any type of test, meaning you don't have any resistance that proves whether or not you're holding on to your faith. That faith is empty. It's just empty words. They don't mean anything. The very act of having to deal with a challenge constitutes the ultimate testimony in favor of truth. And the penultimate, meaning the, the test before the very last, the penultimate passage into true life. This is how you get to test yourself before the final life, before the life after death. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this information told us, get yourself ready, try yourself, test yourself, practice, have a pilot run, so to speak. Not only we have one pilot run, as we described with this days before death, we have 60, 70 years worth of training, preparation, pilot runs for the time of actual death. Afterwards, what happens? More of the same, whatever you have experienced during that days before deep sleep, you will experience for the rest of your existence after death. So it is only what you have done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a transgressor against those who have taken themselves as slaves to others or those who have selected to be ibad, wayfarers toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both categories will receive their just dues. I hope this is clear. Iblis consists of all the reasoning and cognitive flaws within us. They are an essential part of our ability to learn and grow. Iblis, therefore, is a part of us as we described. What about shaitan? Shaitan consists of our own susceptibility to block ourselves off from the divine guidance that is destined to us. So we block ourselves. But you need to learn. You need to educate yourself. You need to get yourself ready. So it's okay to listen to people, but guidance is always sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you choose to cut that umbilical cord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will seem aloof, will seem distant from you. Ta'ala, he will separate himself and you no longer have any chance to receive directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the role of shaitan is consists of our own susceptibility to block off the divine guidance. Shaitan is strengthened by our own choices, our own choices to accept associates with Allah and to accept other sources of guidance. So when you tell me hadith or narrations or a book of seerah or a book of tafsir dominates over what the Quran itself says, you're rejecting the Quran, you're denying the Quran, you're belying the signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that strengthens shaitan, that gives shaitan in you more presence, more power over you, more dominance over you. So you're hurting yourself not only temporarily, but more permanently, because shaitan becomes that much harder to remove. And that's why I keep telling you, you have to practice unlearning, unlearning what you thought you knew, reject some of those things that they told us and let's open our eyes and read the Quran with fresh version reception, pure reception, seeking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is especially true for engaging the Quran. And finally, I need to deal with one last issue, one last question 
is there a devil in the Quran as in Satan of the Bible? And this is such an important question. I left it to the very end. And I know, just watch in the comment stream, a lot of people are going to be confusing the two. There is no Satan in the Quran as defined in the Western tradition, the tradition that follows the Bible. There is no Satan in the Quran. Shaitan in the Quran is something totally different than what's called the devil that they told us about. Shaitan, as I just illustrated throughout this whole segment, is part of our nafs. It's actually part of our subconscious part of our nafs. And it drives us to disconnect ourselves from rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the answer is no, absolutely not. There is no Satan as defined in the Bible within the Quran. Every human being is held responsible for what he or she does. And if this is not a message that humanists all over the world like, then I don't know what they're seeking. This is exactly the highest level of humanity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us by clearly defining the concept of shaitan. Shaitan in the Quran does not absolve you of responsibility. Shaitan in the Quran is khannas, is defeatable, you can win over shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught you exactly how you can fall into the traps of shaitan and how you can get out of the traps of shaitan. So every person is responsible for his own actions, period. This ayah from Surah Al-Qiyamah tells us, بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرَةِ وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَاذِيرَةِ Nay, insan, meaning the divinely guidable man, is dominant over his own insights, even if he were to offer his own excuses. No excuses acceptable. And in this ayah, وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِهِ And we obligated every insan to prospects of his own destiny based on what he espouses, what he accepts, what he believes in, what he accepts as creed, as aqidah. Unuq is described in the Quran to refer to the verb anaqa, and we say i'tanaqa, i'tanaqa, he accepted a religion, he accepted a creed. So unuq is from the same gerund, what he espouses, what he believes in. So every person is obligated to prospects of his own destiny based on what he believes in, what he accepts of creed. So in essence, no one is given a free pass. No one, not even the most uneducated people are given a free pass. How the standards of judgment are going to be applied to these people, Allah knows. But every single human being will be held responsible in accordance to the standards set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person who is mentally defective in some biological manner, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how to deal with him. We have to treat that person in the best way. We have to treat all human beings in the best way, assuming that they all started as babies and developed as we saw, but eventually they become responsible for their actions. And therefore, when I talk about the books of tafsir, I'm not talking about judging these people as if I am Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm talking about critiquing their results, their works, what they wrote with their own pens, assuming they wrote these books. So we're talking about judging and critiquing the works, not judging and critiquing the people. Allah will judge the people. So no one is given a free pass, no intermediaries or evil foreign agent, a Satan, you know, a horned devil wearing red with a red tail, etc., coming out of hell, all of these images that, that really spoil the concept of personal responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us all throughout the Quran about the concept of shaitan. So no evil foreign agents having control over any of us. No agents foreign to us, outside of us, having any type of control over us, as we just saw in these two ayats. So it is just you yourself and Allah and you have no one else to blame or to provide justification on your behalf or to have to defend you. No one will want to defend you. Now we move to the dua. 
الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسل ربنا بالحق Thank you very much for watching. Salamun alaikum.